Section 1 of In Italy with the 332nd Infantry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Italy with the 332nd Infantry by Joseph L. Letow. Section 1 introduction the three hundred and thirty second infantry regiment n a was organized in the early days of september nineteen seventeen at camp sherman ohio around a nucleus of four commissioned officers and about thirty enlisted men of the regular army the first selectives arrived at camp september fifth nineteen seventeen and from that day until the regiment's departure for europe the personnel was constantly changing newly arrived men being trained for a few months and then being sent to other camps and overseas all the necessary shots in the back drills hikes rifle practice bayonet work signaling tent pitching and kitchen police were gone through and at last on may twenty fourth 1918 with ranks filled and hopes high we boarded the train for camp merritt new jersey after a weary twelve days here of endless clothing checks physical examinations and dripping letters to loved ones we proceeded to hoboken crossed the river to the majestic aquitania second largest ship afloat and went to our er staterooms we were too much filled with curiosity to explore this huge vessel to think much of the coming dangers we lay next to the pier until the morning of june eighth when to our disgust we were ordered below until the ship should have cleared the harbor so we left america without even the slight consolation of wafting a kiss to miss liberty whose features we were not to see for ten long weary months besides the three hundred and thirty second infantry there were aboard major general glenn with his staff and about two thousand men of medical units to our great surprise and a twinge of misgiving we had no escort after the first day out and this with the u-boats spreading terror along our coast at this time even coney island had been darkened at night however the aquitania had speed as well as grace and it would have required a fast u-boat to drive a torpedo into her side as she sped on her zigzag course the weather was perfect and we proceeded without adventure until the fourth day out when someone sighted what he thought was the periscope of a submarine i think he must have been a medic at any rate his loudly voiced cry started a small panic which might have reached disastrous dimensions had not word suddenly come that the object sighted was a floating buoy used by the transports for a target in practice firing some of the most intensely interesting minutes aboard were spent watching the little three-inch guns which every few minutes turned on their pivots as they followed each suspicious-looking object in the water there were not enough gunners, so several doughboys were detailed to render assistance. Besides these guardians of the public welfare, the regular guard was stationed at various points on the ship, the companies taking their turn at guard duty. By way of showing the submarines what they thought of them, our excellent band gave several greatly enjoyed concerts on the open deck. On the morning of June 15th, Ireland was sighted, and before noon we had passed up the river mersey and stood on land once more in the city of liverpool england our stay here was confined to a walk from the pier to a railroad station about two miles away the english cordially welcomed us and sent us off with a boys band conducted by a genial elderly man the ride from liverpool in the peculiar little english coaches took us across the rich farmlands of southern england we passed through so many tunnels that when i think of england i think of tunnels broken here and there by little towns containing little brick houses bordered by pretty little gardens most neatly kept arriving at southampton we hiked miles to a rest camp 
i would not dare mention these two words in the vicinity of a doughboy for it is true we do not understand the english language as our english friends do imagine yourself and twelve others occupying a tent made for eight in this tent luxuriously furnished with a wooden floor and a tent pole then imagine resting on a bed consisting of the contents of your pack namely two blankets one mast kit one shelter half one rope one tent pole five pins one suit of bvds two pairs of socks and a pair of shoelaces keep your picture moving and imagine the task of collecting your property in the morning and making a neat roll and this is what they call a rest camp we began to take war seriously if this is a rest camp we thought why but figure it out for yourself indeed we were glad to leave southampton on the cattle boats which awaited us end of section one section two of in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry by joseph l Letow. chapter one france France at last! Early on the morning of June 17, 1918, our little cattle boat, having safely traversed the submarine-infested channel, steamed into the ancient harbor of Havre. In the gray morning, not much of the town could be seen, and anyway, we were too busy to admire the scenery. Companies were formed and trucks loaded, and we started for the camp, our eyes wide with curiosity for we were in france that land of which we had heard so much for the last two years i retain an impression of a dusty aged wasted city of old brick and stone buildings the shopkeepers signs were interesting and mysterious as we moved away from the business district we passed many piles of ammunition and cannon guarded by algerian soldiers it was edifying to see these colored soldiers snap to attention everywhere however our passage was marked for the absence of anything like a greeting from the natives we wondered in america on the train racing to the coast whistles shrieked bells rang and people cheered in england bands played and people loudly applauded yet here in france to whose immediate aid we were rushing no word of welcome came to us it was grim did france think that america was too slow was france too sorrowful at her losses did she think that these dressed-up shopmen farmers and clerks were poor substitutes for her own brave who had died in the vain attempt to stem the german tide whatever her thoughts we saw nothing to confirm the prevalent idea that the french are an excitable people Continuing through the winding streets, up and down hills, we came to a sandy wire-enclosed field containing a few wooden buildings and many tents. It was a dreary-looking place, and the painted signs giving directions to be followed in case of an air raid failed to put any humor in the situation. Outside the barbed wire fence, which held us prisoners, a sentinel paced up and down, on the street there were at times several boys waiting and begging for food or cigarettes at mealtime the number increased and with them came women and girls begging for food a walk around showed us that the camp was scarcely more than a makeshift and we hoped we would not remain long while here some of us had near baths which we shall never forget for an hour we stood in line waiting our turn to enter the bathhouse and when at last we entered and had gotten soaked up the water limit for the day was reached and the water was turned off about noon of the eighteenth we moved from this camp luckily for us we were first at the train and upon discovering that eight men and all their equipment irrespective of rank 
excepting commission officers were to be jammed into one compartment made for eight to sit in and that we were to spend the night there we began to consider the matter seriously before long one of the boys unfolded a plan and a moment later three busier sergeants major than we three could not have been found we turned baggage smashers and in a few minutes a whole second-class compartment was empty and later some of the officers discovered that there were as many as three of them to a compartment our ride across france took us close to paris but as we passed at night we did not see it france is beautiful there was the same orderliness that we noticed in england except that there was more evidence of recent neglect the hedges along the tracks which in other days had been so well kept now showed lack of attention cattle were few and far between and no young men were seen except those in uniform on the afternoon of the nineteenth we arrived at a town named Fulan. however we remained in the cars until darkness we saw no reason for wasting these daylight hours but later learned that troop movements were allowed only under cover of darkness where are we do you think we're near the front isn't this a blank of a place to stop these were the unanswerable questions we asked each other at last we were ordered from the train the companies except one were formed and marched away into the dark silent rainy night as usual we attended to the loading of our boxes and when this was accomplished we climbed aboard the truck just about this time however the officer who had been left behind to supervise the loading of supplies saw us on top of the truck with angry voice he wanted to know what we were doing there and before anyone mustered up courage to present an alibi he ordered us off leaving only a half dozen aboard to unload the baggage sorrowfully we climbed down but we left our packs on the truck and we felt that we had slipped one over at any rate at eleven o'clock we fell in behind c company and began the memorable march to mandres the rain had ceased and the night was now truly beautiful the stars above shone brightly and as we marched up the valley alongside a silvery canal flanked on both sides by cool whispering trees we found it difficult to believe that a desperate battle raged a few miles away we walked at a good pace for fifty minutes and then rested ten minutes according to the army marching rules of course we smoked a cigarette the doughboy's best friend and enjoyed for the time the coolness and quiet it was difficult to get up and continue the march and long before the next rest period came our feet were dragging how these lads with heavy packs stood it is difficult to understand remember that for about forty hours we had been riding in a space that scarcely permitted stretching when the order came for the second rest period the stars as interesting phenomena had lost their charm even a cigarette was unattractive we wanted to lie down and sleep 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 when the order to fall in came again we stumbled to our feet and actually fell in the next hour was torture never did we want rest so much now and then we sighted a town ahead and our spirits rose but always it seemed our town was further on why are there so many hills in france will we never get to that town is the captain on the right road these thoughts filled our minds and i believe some of the men walked in their sleep this condition was not exceptional it was the general feeling everything ends and at last we had climbed our last hill and had arrived in the muddy street of a quaint little stone house town lights began to twinkle here and there and people came out to see their first american soldiers it was two a m i understand that we were going into billets but it seemed impossible to find room for one thousand men in these few houses at length several detachments moved away some of these men climbed ladders and disappeared into attics and haylofts others passed from view into cellars and barns so these are billets after our detachment had stood in the road many minutes 
we began to realize that unless we ourselves found a place to sleep we would very likely be there in the road until daybreak therefore we marched up the street and found a newly constructed wooden building entered it picked up the softest looking piece of wood and went to bed we who stopped in mandres were fortunate as the second and third battalions were stationed four or five miles beyond mandres in the morning after a breakfast of canned willy canned tomatoes and crackers we located regimental headquarters later we learned that there were rooms for some of us we had pictured a hayloft at best but when we found that we had drawn rooms containing real beds we were pleased beyond description two of us were billeted in the home of an old lady who smiled and talked incessantly but since our french was in its infancy and had not reached the talking stage we could only grin at her and say oui oui whenever it appeared time however we got along famously when the lady finally bowed herself out we examined the room the bed drew our attention immediately it was not six feet long i am and i know the bed was not and it stood about four feet from the floor the odd thing about it was a sort of feather bed on top of the covers we could never learn to use it as a cover but always lovingly put it upon the floor whenever we did not fear the lady's coming one of the covers was made entirely of heavy exquisite lace pretty to look at but not half as warm as our three thin blankets there were two pictures on the wall both of young soldiers and we knew why the old lady was so kind to us a dresser and a stand with bowl and pitcher completed the room simple it was but a mansion compared to what we expected the companies were put to work immediately those men who had offended were given the task of rendering a town sanitary that had been unsanitary since the first man and his cow had come to live there the others embarked upon a six weeks training schedule the author of which evidently had never heard of relaxation from early morning when the bugle blew assembly khaki-clad youths came down ladders out of cellars out of barns and out of houses and throughout the day pausing only at noon american cries and activities resounded through the ordinarily quiet village until nightfall our service at the front it appeared would begin at the expiration of these six weeks as mentioned above not all of our regiment were stationed at this town mandres for it was too small headquarters a b c and d companies were here the second and third battalions and supply and machine gun companies were at little towns close by called esse leo don marie and lenques however practically the same events took place at each little town at stated times the different companies leaving their stations met on the line of march and when a prearranged point was reached skirmishes and trench maneuvers were executed the noon meal was served in the field from the rolling kitchens drinking water was frowned on while marching and at the conclusion of a march there were generally many thick tongues parched throats and black lips during june a party of commissioned and non-commissioned officers were sent to the infantry school at chatelon sur somme there to further their education in military matters generally in the evenings the boys wrote letters and read the paris edition of the chicago tribune and the new york herald also the thirst was quenched the water was under the ban of the medical officer unless it was purified by the addition of hypochloride of lime this water was placed in a lister bag hung upon a tripod and was liked less than the various vins and brandies offered in the vin shops especially since most of these little shops were presided over by mademoiselles during the day no drinks could be sold to americans but after the companies were dismissed until taps the shopkeepers reaped a harvest of francs the y m c a red cross k f c and salvation army apparently did not know of our existence for we saw nothing of them the nearest y m c a was at mojant about two and one-half miles distance 
our excellent band made the evenings happy for french and americans with splendid concerts on the square many visits were made to the french homes ostensibly they were for the purpose of learning the french language and customs however the home with a feminine teacher was generally the most popular school near our abode was the home of a very dear old french couple where we learned that in this locality the chief industry was the manufacture of knives and scissors all work was done by hand in the homes our host plied his trade in the room which was also kitchen dining room and bedroom the little cook stove not more than two feet high looked like a toy while the fuel used was twigs the average villager was kind to us but the shopkeepers were very grasping they sold their articles for any sum they thought they could get from the americans this profiteering especially in foodstuffs was the cause of an order to the americans forbidding them to buy certain foodstuffs for the profiteers raised prices so high that the natives could not buy these articles however the order was not always obeyed for the temptation to have a home-cooked meal was very great now and then enough francs could be gathered together to have a banquet of chicken french fried potatoes eggs lettuce homemade bread butter and vin the reader has heard of the thrifty french housewife but i hope he will not condemn the boys for passing up the chicken head and feet which were served on the plate except on sundays most of the people wore wooden shoes and they could be heard clattering along on the road a block away on june twenty ninth we were told that general pershing was coming to review us that meant a night of polishing guns cleaning quarters grounds and clothes when he came the next day premier clemenceau accompanied him general pershing smiled and spoke to the boys as he passed along the line he looked like a man capable of doing big things the next day a rumor went forth that we were scheduled to go to italy as a propaganda regiment to encourage the italians as this rumor gained credence the study of french lost ground and many copies of french for soldiers went to the bottom of the barracks bags on the fourth of july we were awakened before reveille by our band which in two separate sections marched around the town endeavoring to see which section could make more noise during the day athletic games were staged and prizes were given to the winners the following week on july ninth elsie janice came to our neighborhood and provided an evening's entertainment we shall never forget in a natural amphitheater a rude wooden stage with improvised lights was built the hillside was dotted with the flowers of the american army the three hundred and thirty first in overseas caps the three hundred and thirty second in campaign caps both regimental bands were near the stage and they kept everyone in good spirits a truck drove up and a piano was unloaded and placed upon the stage shortly after miss janice and her mother arrived in a limousine and from the moment the door of the car opened until she left the stage everyone had a wonderful time miss janice sang several songs new to us and her parodies and accompanying antics were greatly enjoyed on july fourteenth francis independence day another holiday was declared we were free to go anywhere possible in the twenty-four hours in order to bring the holiday spirit to the whole regiment the band was sent around to the various towns in each town a short concert was played and at the second battalion headquarters it cooperated in a pleasant program of speeches and songs attended by the french people as well as the soldiers a few days later the order to move to italy was officially announced and a transfer of physically imperfect men took place some of our men were sent to the three hundred and thirty first while they were to transfer better men to the three hundred and thirty second the transfer was effected but when our doctors examined the new men they found many of them in poorer condition than those we had sent to the three hundred and thirty first so it was necessary to use some strenuous language and to go through the process of transfer once more during july the americans were fighting around chateau pierre and were stopping the german drive that was causing france to despair 
possibly this success assured our trip to italy for after this time our movement was speeded up many things were necessary such as rolling stock travel rations equipment motor trucks etc we understood that we were the only american regiment going to italy and therefore we would have to take care of much that is usually looked after by special units however on july twenty fifth the first section of the three hundred and thirty second marched to Fulain, boarded the train and was on the way to italy end of section two section three in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry by joseph l letow chapter two france to italy soma campagna and verona there were about thirty motor trucks and two touring cars fastened on flat cars and these trucks filled with canvas tents looked more inviting to us than the notorious box cars marked forty ohms eight chevrons this journey which was to occupy three days and two nights was remarkable for its changing scenes and climates leaving foulon about three p m july twenty fifth we proceeded in a southeastern direction reaching gray about twilight drawing forth our canned willy crackers tomatoes etc we had dinner upon completing this luxurious repast we pulled a canvas tarpaulin over us and put our bedroom in shape the evening air was growing colder as we approached the mountains but we slept comfortably even though we had allowed ourselves the luxury of removing shoes and puttees while we had taken care of ourselves in this manner the boys in the box cars were anything but comfortable the french box car is not the large one we see on american railroads and it was only by taking turns at lying down that any one got any sleep we awoke early and found ourselves in the scenic foothills of the alps little villages snuggled up on the mountain sides the stone roofs sparkling in the sunshine like those of a fairy city there was as usual the towering church in each village round which the houses clustered like little chicks under the mother hen's wings here and there as we journeyed on we saw wonderfully constructed castles set on high peaks commanding the countryside one glance at their evident strength together with the thought that firearms were unknown in the old days and one ceased to wonder how the barons ruled the country in feudal days not only were the castles strongly built they were beautiful as well and the eye loved to dwell on them as long as they were in sight many mountains are absolutely barren they seem to be exhausted with the age-long battle with the elements when napoleon marched through these valleys they were old when hannibal led his conquering carthaginians they were old and the years since have added nothing but more scars and fissures to their sides a few miles of these barren hills were quite depressing and we were glad when they had been left behind and mountains green from top to bottom took their places many of the peaks were snow-capped though the days were quite mild the next large city we passed through was aix les bains we had no time to try the famous waters for the train starter with his little fish horn soon sent us on our way shortly after we passed through chambury and when we woke on the morning of the twenty seventh we were on the way to montmelion this town was of especial importance to us because here in the mountains the english had established a washing station our train stopped and every one got off and enjoyed a wash or a shave hot coffee was furnished and we had our noonday meal with our toilet and meal completed we proceeded journeying on past st julian and st michel past the lovely waterfall at la praz and finally reached modane the last french town about nine p m 
we remained here more than an hour the red cross representatives distributed bars of chocolate and hot coffee with rum all of which was thankfully received on this cold night about ten thirty p m an electric engine was attached to our train and we were whizzed through a very long tunnel upon reaching the other end we were in italy the inhabitants of the little town at which we stopped were most enthusiastic in their welcome although it was near midnight a band played the star-spangled banner italian troops saluted and the people gave us chocolate little flags cigarettes and sandwiches we wondered that italy had such an abundance of these articles since france was barren an italian general caused much laughter when he approached the boys torch in hand to inspect the americans the italians have a way of waving the hand in greeting that furnished much amusement the arm is held up palm of the hand inward and the hand is rapidly opened and closed shouts of viva l'americani accompanied each move of the fingers the boys were quick to reply and answering shouts of viva l'italia came from them later in the night we entered turin and here again were delightfully received we ourselves could not realize what our presence meant to these people in the early morning we passed beautiful lake como and some time later caught a glimpse of milan the outline of her venerable cathedral standing out from the lower buildings of the city our train section did not enter milan but another section stopped there and the boys marched through the city amid great applause one could not journey across the northern part of italy from the border of milan without exclaiming at the fertility of the soil every inch of ground is productive and the climate is much warmer than on the other side of the mountains at noon on the twenty seventh we reached verona again our progress was halted by our enthusiastic allies who showered us with little italian flags and handkerchiefs while their bands played our national anthem over and over of course this was popular with us as it gave us an opportunity of standing at attention and saluting once more we started and our next and final stop was villafranca here amid great enthusiasm we detrained the american red cross surprised us with hot coffee and doughnuts and never was a lunch more appreciated while we ate american aviators flew above us doing amazing stunts we eventually collected all of the headquarters property put it on a truck and set out for soma campagna later called summer complaint in less than half an hour we came into this little town which was to be the home of regimental headquarters headquarters company and the first battalion the second battalion and field hospital number three thirty one were located at historic custoso the third battalion remained at villafranca with the supply company the three thirty first field hospital had been attached to the regiment when we left france the machine gun company was alone at villa cantini our driver took us through the walled cities of the town and set us down before the doors of the villa of one thousand and one roses not knowing where our quarters were to be we made our bunks on the floor right there we became acquainted with the italian mosquito and of all the mosquitoes we had met he is the most voracious and insistent cusses and slaps were heard throughout the night at every move of the regiment new orders governing the actions of the troops are issued so for a long time we were quite busy getting these out not too busy however to explore our villa it was the property of an italian countess widow of an italian general the building of white stone had a balcony in front from which the countess often looked down at the curious americanos at the south end there was a large room very likely a conservatory the walls of which were covered with what were at one time beautiful paintings this was the office of the sergeant's major at the other end of the building the colonel and adjutant had their desks in front of the building the road divided forming a round plot of grass on which were shrubbery flowers and palm trees to the left was a thicket of bamboo trees 
to the right were majestic palms immediately before our entrance was a grape arbor which in the hot weather was very enticing the rear however was most attractive passing across the court shut in on three sides by the villa the garage and the servants quarters one came to a grove of cool hanging trees winding paths bordered by the hedgerows led through this grove to the edge of a steep hill here a small balcony of stone had been built and one could see directly below the white road twining its serpentine course among green trees past little red roof village houses presided over by the eternal campanile of the village church while we sweltered in the sun amid these tropical surroundings the mountain tops visible across the valley were snow-capped some campagna is quite small when one walked through the streets there was a feeling as being walled in the church the municipio the vino shops and the houses were made of stone and walls of masonry extended around the boundaries of each person's property five minutes walk took one into the country and the country meant the open fields for in italy the farmers live in the towns and go out to work their farms possibly we had come to italy to cement national relations to put out any lingering fire of love the northern italians had for the germans to show italy that america was at her side nevertheless as in france when assembly sounded in the early morning doughboys gun in hand poured from barns cellars and houses for the daily work on the hottest days drills were ordered and borne but when evening came the tension was relaxed and until ten thirty the boys had good times in this section of italy there are many irrigation ditches fed by mountain streams so that the farms are very productive these streams and ditches were very popular as swimming places after a hot day's drill and along the banks could be seen many future husbands drilling themselves in the art of laundering then there were the new vinos wines and cognacs of italy to be tried and many pleasant evenings were spent in dingy little shops we would not think of entering at home others musically inclined struck up an acquaintance with the owner of a piano and thus amused themselves with the good old american tunes the italians generally liked american ragtime we were made welcome everywhere and in turn thought highly of our hosts some of us were fortunate enough to secure rooms with beds and we felt as if we were going to like the war in italy owing to mosquitoes we found use for the mosquito nets issued by the quartermaster for we persisted in sleeping with the windows open despite our landlady who insisted on closing them the natives close their windows at night and sprinkle water upon the floor the kitchen of this house contained a stone fireplace with a large copper pot hung on a tripod in this vessel almost everything was cooked over a fire made of twigs near the fireplace hung a pair of copper pails in which the women carried drinking water these pails are fastened in the ends of a wooden device which fits over the shoulders and it was a common sight to see the women carrying them up the street while their wooden shoes clattered on the pavement in italy there is a great devotion to the madonna as is evident from the many shrines along the roads an incident in this connection is worth recording illustrating how this faith and devotion is inculcated in the children from birth the baby of the house stumbled fell upon the floor and cried her elder sister about fourteen quickly picked up a statue of the madonna and held it toward the infant the latter's face lighted as she grasped the statue and the cries abruptly ceased as she pressed the statue to her lips while at summa campagna two important personages visited us one the king of italy who reviewed the regiment august first and complimented it highly on its marching and bearing the other the prince of wales who lunched with the colonel at this town we became acquainted with the italian oxen and donkeys it was an extraordinary sight to see a team consisting of an ox and a very small donkey drawing a cart our meals here were very poor at least in our company this question is largely up to the mess sergeant and cooks 
but often if the officers gave more attention to the meals they would be better it was said our beef was killed one day and served the next so that it was too fresh to eat and accordingly many claimed it caused illness the handshaking policy seemed to have taken possession of every one upon entering italy and in line with this one half of the regiment was given passes and truck rides to verona every sunday verona is about an hour's ride from soma campagna one has many thoughts on entering a famous old italian city here is verona old before the discovery of america within whose walls great dante lived and saw his beatrice which event gave to the world one of its sublimest poems the divine comedy here is the tomb of romeo and juliet who have been made immortal by shakespeare here is the old arena built under diocletian in 290 a d here is the tomb of the scaglieri here is the church of saint anastasia built in 1261 how we wandered through this ancient city amid strange yet somehow familiar scenes how we wished we had studied our history and literature more diligently when in school how we longed to speak the italian language so that we might ask about this palace that statue this old church that curious inscription there is much to see and to learn in old verona as many treasures of the past so fondly preserved have not materially stopped the progress of this age for the stores of its narrow business street broadway we called it through which no horse or automobile passes showed all the modern appliances to be found in the stores of the original broadway we were delightfully surprised while we were in verona a moving picture blatantly billed as the mysteries of new york was being shown we were not interested but we did live through one act of an insipid love play in another theatre the italian idea of love as depicted on the screen is too soft for the rough and ready american and italian movies were never popular with the boys our band sometimes came to verona to play the bandstand was in a small park within a stone's throw of the arena across the street were several restaurants to one of these we found our way and without trouble fell into the delightful italian habit of taking refreshments seated at a table placed out upon the spacious sidewalk we discovered near ice cream and were quite happy incidentally we learned that the signorinas of italy are very lovely and that they are not amateurs in dressing attractively those of the better class are always chaperoned in the evening there were many such in company of father or father and mother and their deportment and beauty caused hearts to beat while thoughts of her in far-off america rushed to mind during a field meet held at verona an american broke the world's record throwing the hand grenade thus in work and play the days passed we loved italy at this time it had been impressed upon us that we had been chosen from the entire a e f to represent american soldiery and that upon our actions americans would be judged the boys strove hard to maintain the standard about the middle of august our colonel began to think that fates and reviews better fitted a conquering army than a regiment so lately civilians he felt that time life with the regiment in four different villages was not good for discipline and to the utter astonishment and objection of the italians civilian and military we moved on the fourteenth of august to a field near Valeggio. End of section three. Section four of In Italy with the 332nd Infantry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3 Intense near Vallegio, Treviso, Villa Angelica. For the first time since we were at Havre, the regiment was united. There were acres of tents in orderly rows forming company streets. 
a highway ran through the centre of the camp separating regimental headquarters and the auxiliary companies from the latter companies instead of the conservatory of a villa we now had a tent for an office instead of a soft bed and a roof over us at night we had a tent and the earth most of us enjoyed this open-air life more than the town life the ground occupied by the regiment was a mulberry grove the peculiar-looking stunted mulberry trees were grown for the leaves upon which the silkworms feed silk was manufactured in villa franca and the neighboring towns Valeggio is very hot and on some days the heat of the sun readily penetrated the canvas and seemed to be trying to dry the blood in our bodies yet through it all the boys drilled how they stood it god only knows of course there were frequent rests but only american grit carried them through war is what sherman said it is but the general thought was that it was not worse than drilling in italy during august while the days were hot the evenings were very pleasant and the nights were cool so that one recuperated from the heat and labor of the day it may be interesting to know what a day meant to this so-called propaganda regiment the following is a copy of a drill schedule in operation at this time monday a m seven to seven thirty physical exercise running jumping obstacles so as to develop agility and endurance of soldiers seven thirty to eight o'clock instruction in use of gas mask eight to eight fifteen rest eight fifteen to nine o'clock company combat drill including debouching from departure trenches attacks against points of resistance nine to ten o'clock bolt manipulation with magazine floor plate magazine spring and follower removed ten to ten fifteen rest ten fifteen to ten forty five platoon close order drill and manual of arms p m two fifty to three thirty position and aiming exercises three thirty to five thirty developing company strong points tuesday schedule the same as for monday except eight fifteen to nine o'clock a m period devoted to giving platoons an opportunity to go over carefully their particular phase of the company combat drill of the previous day using gas masks seven thirty to eight o'clock a m bayonet instruction wednesday same as monday except the period eight fifteen to nine o'clock during which time instructions will be given company specialists thursday same as wednesday except seven thirty to eight o'clock bayonet instruction friday practice march under assumed tactical situations saturday trenches looks like a real day's work in any climate later much of this drill was changed to sham battle and trenches in conjunction with italy's justly famous arditi under major allegretti each battalion took its turn in occupying prepared trenches which they undertook to hold against battalions bullets bombs and signals were used and an amateur would have thought a real battle was in progress near these trenches were vineyards and thereby hangs a tale which however must not be told now a rifle range was also constructed and those men who had never fired a rifle were given instruction the one pound and trench mortar batteries also had a range and our neighborhood took on more of a warlike appearance than the italian austrian front our machine gun men were not idle either for they were sent to an italian machine gun school in the mountains where they were drilled and perfected in such trifles as hitting targets on the opposite side of a mountain they learned to shoot the fiat italian guns as well as their own however though we worked hard through september and into october life was not all work in the camp itself we finally had a red cross and a y m c a hut which were well patronized it was a common sight to see two hundred or more boys in the canteen line waiting to buy cigarettes chocolate bars and lemonade near the camp was an irrigation ditch about five to seven feet wide and about four feet deep about a mile away was the mencio river 
a real mountain stream we bathed in both places but one day the powers that were decreed that the enlisted men should swim in the ditch for officers only were allowed in the river it is superfluous to reproduce the comment but let the reader think of nearly four thousand men in a ditch in which clothes also were washed while for less than two hundred officers there was a large river one could also go to the little town of Alegio. it had nothing to offer except the usual little wine shops and grocery stores where we showed a decided fondness for the swiss chocolate and almonds occasionally some one would go out into the country and bring back enough eggs tomatoes potatoes etc so that a few of the boys could enjoy a real meal in a signora's kitchen we had been at the camp for several days when we were surprised by the arrival of the officers and non-commissioned officers we had left at the infantry school in france a few were missing they having been given duties in france while at the tented camp the system inaugurated at soma campagna of using the trucks on sundays to show italy to the regiment and the regiment to italy was continued in our first trip on august eighteenth was to Peschiera, situated on lake garda beautiful crystal blue lake garda like many italian towns Peschiera boasts a splendid old wall relic of the days of battle the town itself held us just during the time required to eat a lunch for there was a boat making a trip around lake garda some time after lunch and we could not miss that trip the lake extends up into austria that country controlling the northern end while italy controls the southern it is fed by streams from the melted snow of the mountains the basis of which meet the water the shores are very rocky and when the boat docked at the little landings the dancing waves could be seen lapping over the doorsteps of the stone houses built on the very edge of the land the villages are beautiful and quaint beyond comparison the picturesque dress of the people the ornamented though poor stone houses the little donkeys the blue crystal clear water all about with the mountain peaks above hidden by clouds made an unforgettable picture most of these simple villagers had never seen an american soldier and when we approached the town at least half the population turned out to stare at us and wave a greeting in their peculiar backhanded way on the hillsides facing the lake many pretty homes have been built always of stone while vines and shrubbery are so well trained and trim that these dwellings look like fairy palaces on the twenty fourth of august the big minstrel show which the talent of the regiment had been rehearsing for some time took place neighboring british and italian officers were to be guests of our officers this evening while two nights later the enlisted men were to entertain the men of the british and italian armies a stage was erected with one side of the y m c a as its back and the orchestra was gaily decorated with lanterns and flags the performance was a regulation american minstrel show and was a great credit to the boys who took part in it besides the minstrel show proper there were sketches by two clever cartoonists several vocal solos a violin solo and dances this may sound ordinary but considering the time the circumstances and the place it will be seen how extraordinary it was the performance was repeated for enlisted men two nights later and once more proved a success these good times however were not to last for on the eleventh of september we said good-bye to our second battalion which had been selected to hold a sector of the italian line on the piave river with moist eyes we watched them march away how many of them our comrades of a year would return but they led by the band stepped away lightly with shining faces i know that even mortal battle was more welcome to them than that soul-deadening drill in the hot sun hourly we awaited news from them but beyond a few meagre reports that they were successfully occupying the trenches we heard little from what i have been able to learn however they went into their sector and held it with characteristic american love of action their quiet sector was hardly bearable 
for americans to stand silently in the trenches and watch enemy shells and aeroplanes pass overhead without replying was unheard of however to take a shot as many wished would have called down upon them the merciless rebuke of the italian general under whose orders they were no unauthorized shooting was allowed so our gallant second chafed and obeyed orders as good soldiers do on friday september thirteenth the remainder of the regiment was engaged in a sham battle they were advancing under a barrage laid down by our machine guns one pounders and trench mortars all the gunners were working fast in an earnest endeavor to make a good showing a group of officers was standing behind the trench mortars watching the mimic battle when without warning there was a terrible explosion one of the trench mortar shells it was thought exploded prematurely scattering death and injury for many yards when the final count was taken it was found that one lieutenant and four men were killed and about forty-seven officers and men were wounded among the officers wounded so badly that they never again joined the regiment were the lieutenant colonel one major and the supply officer on september fourteenth there was a great military funeral when the dead were lovingly laid to rest in the italian cemetery at villa franca on september eighteenth b company and the band went to rome to participate in the annual september twentieth celebration with them were several of our best athletes when the americans arrived in rome the italians wondered why they had come however seeing that they were there they offered an italian barracks to them besides this incident the most noteworthy event was the disappointment of being in rome with no money for many of the boys were robbed in this barracks of the few lires they had about this time september twenty fifth the fighting in the vicinities of st miel st quentin and dix Mund was fiercely progressing and the allies were smashing great holes in the hindenburg line by the light of a candle the regimental interpreter read the news from the daily italian papers and as he called the names of the towns mentioned we drew red ink lines on our map of france these were thrilling days these glowing reports from the western front and the everlasting drilling combined to make life extremely disgusting to the boys many feared that the war would be over before the three thirty second ever saw the front and none of us could understand why the italian front was so quiet while at every other point where there were allies there was a hail of shot and shell a camp bulletin was written by one of the chaplains and it proved very popular until it was forced to suspend publication after the sixth issue owing to the lack of duplicating paper for the mimeograph machine at this time a postcard craze seized nearly everyone the postcard industry in italy is surpassed only by the vino and macaroni industries on september thirtieth bulgaria capitulated after a series of severe battles with the serbians greeks and french during this time you will remember the second battalion was in the trenches and it was generally thought that the first or third battalion would go up to relieve them in a few weeks the colonel's idea in occupying these trenches was to reserve a place for the americans when the day of battle came however before this plan could be carried out the tents at vallejo were struck and the regiment was moved to treviso by train and the second battalion was ordered from the trenches so as to join the regiment at treviso regimental headquarters remained till the last everyone except about twenty of us had gone we were to follow in trucks with the records boxes etc it was sad and lonesome to look at the former sight of a living bustling camp now deserted and dead only a few fires burning rubbish remained to mark the place with the coming of daylight we loaded the trucks and set out for treviso the trip occupied the entire day but it was pleasant in every respect on passing through a village one could always get hot coffee chocolate and fresh bread which helped our canned meals considerably it was evening when we reached our troops billeted in an italian barracks on the outskirts of treviso having no definite orders to proceed we remained for the night 
in the morning we received orders to go to a villa outside of treviso which we did the name was villa angelica the estate was a large one with the usual tropical trees and luxuriant vegetation even in october our sleeping quarters were in one of the wings of the u-shaped building the walls and floors were of stone or cement and with no fire they were not very comfortable with only a straw tick and a blanket separating one from the floor our office was a chapel and part of the floor consisted of six marble slabs marking the last resting place of former members of the family being now quite near the front we could see at least five italian observation balloons dozens of aeroplanes passed overhead daily and parts of many battles were seen as the aviators pursued one another across the sky while here we saw an austrian plane suddenly dart out from behind a cloud and blow up an observation balloon before the observer could descend at night all lights were forbidden and the rumbling of the guns told us to heed the warning however it seems that americans are ever ready to take a chance and with window blinds securely fastened many a grand poker game was played by the candlelight this was our only recreation outside the nights were black and one took his life in his hands to go walking we thought a great drive was eminent for every night the roads leading to the front were alive with moving vehicles it seemed as though the steady flow of slow-moving guns would never stop and we marveled at the dexterity of the unlighted flying camions as they raced to the front with loads of supplies and raced to the rear for more our companies were on the outskirts of treviso in two italian barracks their daily tasks were drills and hikes on october fourteenth samuel gompers paid us a visit the band played in his honor and his face brightened to hear the familiar ragtime it gave a short address on the value of teamwork two days later we were ordered to treviso we had expected to go forward however despite our grumblings at the many moves we were glad to bid farewell to villa angelica and its darkness end of section four section five of in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry by joseph l letow section five chapter four treviso before the drive treviso is situated about eighteen miles northwest of venice before the war its population was about seventeen thousand but when we came to treviso it looked like a city of the dead nearly all the buildings were locked and the windows were boarded up while many houses were in ruins from aeroplane raids most of the people had fled a walk around the town revealed an entirely different style of architecture than we had ever seen this difference consists in the second floor of the buildings arching over the sidewalks as far as the curb the supports being columns flush with the curbing the arrangement was beneficial during the long rainy season many canals of a questionable degree of sanitation dissect the town it was a constant wonder to us that disease did not result from them it is certain that many mosquitoes were bred there the women washed clothes on the banks of the streams a city wall of ancient date as could be seen from the venetian lion shown thereon completely encircled the town this lion found on many walls and monuments in the vicinity marked the time when venice ruled treviso and adjacent territory from the fourteenth to the seventeenth centuries there were few buildings of note the cathedral of san pietro with titian's annunciation and the municipio were most important besides these there were the usual shops selling military goods mostly of american origin perfumes postcards and vino at night treviso was not inviting 
having been severely bombed by austrian aviators no outside lights were tolerated and those burning indoors had to be well screened the only places where one could find amusement were in the little wine rooms the typical approach to one was through a dark narrow street a tiny gleam of light cast a streak across the alley as one drew near loud laughter and talk was heard it is bottled sunshine present in the red and white wines the cognacs vermouths and grappa the headquarters of the regiment and our billets were in a three-story college building which with its many small rooms made the most ideal place we had had thus far the offices were well furnished with good tables desks chairs and electric lights there was also a piano which with the stringed instruments played by members of the band made a jazz band that commanded attention the companies were still housed in the two barracks straw was provided for the bed sacks which were placed on the floor stone floors may wear better than wooden floors but they are not nearly so efficient as beds the next time there is a war let's hope it is in a country where wooden floors are in style the rolling kitchens were set up in the yard below where the meals were served the meals generally consisted of beef brown beans macaroni rice coffee war bread and macaroni rice war bread beef brown beans and coffee on the thirteenth of october the second battalion came out of the trenches and about two days later joined us at treviso though not one had been injured or killed they were proclaimed heroes and were the envy of the regiment the work of the day consisted of long vigorous hikes with full mobile equipment worn to add to the work the weather was rainy and cold it was at this time that the changing of clothes was adopted in order to create a false impression as to the number of americans in italy upon going out in the morning overcoats and helmets were worn and upon returning in the afternoon by a different route the overcoats and helmets were out of sight and raincoats and caps were worn the next day perhaps the change would be to leather jerkins the object was attained for later the austrian prisoners reported that they had been under the impression that there were several divisions of americans in italy in treviso we were fortunate enough to be able to obtain hot baths in real tubs two hospitals one of which had been bombed containing seven and five tubs respectively became the busiest places in town the price of two and one half lires per bath was charged sharing treviso with us were several thousand italian soldiers and a few thousand english and scotch troops these british troops were a happy crowd four years of war had made happy-go-lucky lads out of the most serious we attended their picture shows played football with them and clinked cups with them in perfect harmony about this time ostend and lille were falling and the whole hindenburg line was crumbling talk of an early peace filled the air this was welcome news for our thoughts were always of home nevertheless we wanted to return only after decisive victory for the allies on the other hand the news from home at this time was startling in its account of the ravages of a strange disease influenza which was decimating our camps and was spreading to the civilians till this time we had had no trouble with the flu about october twenty ninth the moon came out in all its silvery splendor it was so noticeable because it was practically the only light we had outdoors the evenings were mild and inviting and as we walked under the arched houses and over the many little stone bridges we talked of the possibility of an air raid for moonlight nights are the delight of aviators on the night of october twenty second i retired early my sleep was unbroken until about eleven p m when i was awakened by an awful concussion which seemed just a block away it appeared to my startled senses that a part of the earth had in some way torn loose from the main body and was hurtling through the sky i do not remember of sitting up in bed but i suppose i did the first object to meet my startled gaze was my roommate running toward the window 
exclaiming what's that i bounded from the bed and gaining the window peered anxiously at the heavens for in a flash i realized it was an air raid despite the din and roar of the guns far and near we could hear the hum of the motors but could see no planes a machine gun across the street in a building with its rapid tat 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 sounded ridiculously like a woodpecker drumming on a tree and in spite of the danger caused much amusement a block or so away a big gun boomed every few minutes while for miles around guns of all sizes spoke the sky was dotted with the beams of powerful searchlights which tried to locate the invaders while the moon was bright there were many small black clouds swiftly moving across the sky it was an ideal night for a raid we listened to the guns and watched the flares and then wondered at the silence in the building upon investigation we found all of the boys in the yard below looking up at the sky we joined them the great light still searched the heavens the beams reminding one of a boy's mirror shining on the ceiling of a room far up black little puffs of smoke from the shells of the anti-aircraft guns floated around and sometimes we mistook them for aeroplanes again far above a small flame would burst forth and drop and all would be dark again it was not long however before we saw the folly of standing in the open for a shrapnel from our guns rained upon the ground near us sounding like horseshoes as they struck the pavement as soon as the rain was over the boys ran out to collect souvenirs these consisting of rusty jagged pieces of iron some eight inches long without seeing the aeroplanes we retired to the straw ticks somewhat disappointed nevertheless before we could get to sleep the big gun up the road spoke again and the chorus of smaller ones followed again we rushed from the room to follow the lights the flares and the smoke clouds this time our curiosity was rewarded with a sight of a plane in the searchlight's ray the whole body of the plane looked as if it had been dipped in phosphorus it gleamed i have no idea how fast that little body moved across the sky shells were bursting all around it and we expected every moment to see it fall a mass of flames but it proved too fast for the gunners as it at length scurried behind a cloud out of the grasp of the searchlight she'll never forget that plane hurrying like a living thing to its haven behind the cloud this thrilling scene enacted we once more returned to resume our sleep however we were again roused when the raiders returned this time the attack was short to our surprise we learned in the morning that no great damage was done and we heard with joy that not an american in any of the three outlying barracks was hurt these boys were not allowed out of the barracks and as one had put it i lay flat on the floor so tight against the wall that i thought i'd push the wall out we thought at that time that the planes were out to bomb roads and supplies but we were told later that they came over to get the english and americans in fact an austrian aviator who had been in the raid was indiscreet enough to boast about it in fiume to some of the third battalion men when they were in fiume when he came to he thought he had collided with the moon with the allies smashing on on every front the long quiet italian front suddenly burst into flame on the morning of october twenty fourth when the fourth italian army began its attack in the mount grappa region the italian commando supremo at last had an opportunity of using its cherished plan which was to separate the austrians in the trentino from those in the piave section by breaking through at vittorio and by an enveloping movement to bring about the fall of the whole mountain front which would in turn make imperative an austrian retreat from the plain during october every available man and gun had been brought to the front and between the brenta river and the sea five armies were concentrated all movements were to be completed by october tenth but the rain raised the piave river which was the dividing line of the two combatants so that nothing could be done until the twenty fourth opposed to the sixty three and one half austrian divisions made up of one million seventy thousand men and seven thousand guns 
were fifty-seven allied divisions, or nine hundred and twelve thousand men, and eight thousand nine hundred and twenty-nine guns. Of these fifty-seven divisions, fifty-one were Italian, three were British, two were French, and one was Czechoslovak. In addition, there was the young and ardent 332nd American Regiment, which was attached to the 10th Army, one of the four armies selected to break through the line before Vittorio. The task allotted to the 10th Army was to force its way across the Piave at the island Gravi di Papadopoli. A desperate battle raged across the entire front, but the 10th could not cross the Piave owing to another rise in the river, until three bridges were thrown across on the 26th. The 10th crossed, broke down the enemy resistance, and went on to Simadomo, taking during the day over 5,600 prisoners and 24 guns. Somehow the 332nd was held in reserve and did not participate in this great battle of Vittorio Veneto, until several days after it had started we were still in treviso the night of the twenty sixth and when now and then an occasional austrian shell whistled over the town we began to think that there was a war in italy some of the boys were in favor of retiring to the specially built dugouts under the city wall i joined a party of italian and italian american soldiers among them an american interpreter we descended into one of these holes my surprise was great when upon reaching the bottom of the steps i found all sizes ages and sexes of civilians and several soldiers some standing some sitting and some lying in cots i had not known that there were so many civilians in treviso we stood around for a few minutes but the atmosphere was such that we decided we would rather risk a big bertha than breathe that air in our party were several Italian telegraphers who maintained a station in the heavily sandbagged building in the center of town. I was invited to accompany them, and I enjoyed several hours of unique entertainment. It was midnight when we arrived at the station. One of the telegraphers went out to procure wine while another reconnoitered the kitchen. The result of their labors was wine, war bread, and onions thus we feasted at two thirty with the repast over and the guns somewhat quieted we heated our drooping eyelids and returned to our quarters the next morning we received the glorious news that the scotch and english had crossed the supposedly impassable piave river and had advanced four miles beyond it several batches of prisoners came in they were a ragged wretched looking lot they did not look like the fierce huns we had heard about from pale emaciated faces their eyes looked out like those of dumb animals an american near me muttered there is a grand indictment of war the allies were pleasantly engaged in going through the pockets of the prisoners in search of souvenirs if something of value was found a cigarette or a piece of bread was given the hapless prisoner sometimes much money of a kind new to the world was found on the austrians the austrians had been so sure of ultimate success that they had printed italian money had paid their soldiers with it and had forced the people whose towns they occupied to accept it the sight of the prisoners sent exciting thoughts through our minds for with the battle raging within earshot we asked each other when will our turn come were we to continue our propaganda mission or were we reserves some time before we had been placed under the command of an italian general and had been assigned to his division did this mean that we moved toward the battle line possibly the commanding officer knew but the boys were bewildered everything seemed set for an early departure barracks bags and surplus supplies had been stowed away and men were detailed to remain as guards the mail service ceased, and when the boys started on the march in the morning, no one knew if they were on a practice march or if they were advancing to battle. As usual, rumors were rampant, and the news reached us at headquarters more than once that our companies had started for the front. On the night of October 28th, about 9 p.m., when I returned from a visit, I found headquarters in an uproar. 
in breathless tones someone informed me that i'd better hurry and get ready for we were leaving before midnight word had been received a few minutes before from the italian commander i bounded up the stairs and into my room most of my effects had been stowed away but i had not anticipated such short notice however my saddle-bags were soon stuffed full my roll was made and when the horses appeared i was ready the colonel and commission staff had gone on ahead and we were to join them later i do not know who received this information but at any rate when we were ready to go no one knew where we were to meet the colonel thus we were in the enviable position of being a w o l lost and our regiment was marching to battle we spurred our horses and raced around the town's quiet dark streets when finally someone bless him noticed several burning cigarette stubs and we shouted for joy no one in italy but americans had cigarettes in abundance so urging our heavily laden horses forward we followed this distinctly american trail and at the city gate met the last company swinging past a long procession of rolling kitchens and carts followed ending with the jolly veterinarian we fell in behind him and began the march destined to end in austria end of section five section six of in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry by joseph l Lettow. chapter five the drive we had not gone far when we were made aware of the overwhelming volume of traffic on this highway troops and trucks were hurrying to the front empty trucks were returning and this road was not built for two trucks and a column of soldiers abreast it was a most irritating advance every few minutes came the command to halt and fall out to the right of the road then when the road was clear we clambered back and proceeded the night was damp and the cold readily penetrated our clothes chilling us to the bone while the frequent stops made it difficult to get warmed up at two thirty a m the column halted and moved over to the side of the road when more than an hour passed and we still remained there in the cold we wondered what was going on at the head of the column toward morning there was a stir around the rolling kitchens a few yards from us and upon investigation we found that breakfast was being prepared we crowded around the welcome fire the hot coffee and rice restored our good spirits and warmed us about six o'clock a m an orderly found the detachment and gave us the order to report at the head of the column upon arriving there we saw the first company in barago being assigned a place to pitch pup tents the town seemed like the gate to the frontier fortunately there was a stone floor and four walls left for us with the weather near the freezing point the floor did not appeal to me as a bed and i searched for boards to lie upon being unable to obtain any i found it necessary to remove a superfluous door a little later when i passed this doorway i noticed that the twin to my door was also missing there was nothing for the regiment to do but await the thinning out of traffic meanwhile our trucks came up with fresh provisions at seven thirty on the morning of the thirty first of october we marched out of virago the road was still congested the principal reason being that the bridges over the piave had been blown up and light pontoons were being used in their stead the same start and stop progress took place and it was not until about two p m that we reached the piave the river is very wide here there being three kilometers between the two shores the streams of the river were very swift and the island was gravelly making progress slow and painful to the burdened men and animals on this island of grave di papadooli we found our first signs of the recent struggle several dead bloated horses and mules halfway in the water met our eyes 
nearby were corpses lying as they had fallen two or three days before helmets gas masks rifles and shells were strewn promiscuously about near the road the island is a forlorn place at best but now battle scarred and with dead men dead horses and implements of warfare lying about it was one's idea of supreme desolation here and there were great yellow splotches showing where the gas shells had fallen at length the last stream was crossed and we left the piave behind us and passed through the ruins of cima dolmo on both sides of the road the small streams of more or less movement seemed to have collected all of the dead men dead animals and rifles the horses we saw had great holes in their flanks starving people under the thumb of a rapacious conqueror are not too particular when food is concerned riding along in silence looking at the poor dead human beings we wondered if a gray-haired mother or flaxen-haired wife would not wait in vain for their return i think many of us pray that we would be spared their fate it seemed terrible to allow these bodies to lie for days like those of animals exposed to weather and prowling beasts later we saw graves large plots where the earth was still soft with a few rude wooden crosses marking them we saw one man lying head foremost in the stream alongside the road it was difficult to believe that a few days before he had been living flesh and blood with beating heart with emotions and hopes such as we all have the fields were pitted with great holes where the shells had struck and the few houses we saw were in ruins no this day's travel was not cheerful however night at last cast its merciful mantle over the poor bits of clay and the ruined towns and when eight o'clock had come we had reached our objective vazola the companies pitched tents alongside the road gathering corn stalks which were placed in the tents to lie upon as the ground was cold and damp the detachment found its way into a poor farmhouse one could step from the home into the barn as both were under the same roof these people were very thankful at their deliverance from the long austrian occupation our interpreters told us that the huns had been living upon locusts boiled grass and domestic animals for some time the people said that they had been cruelly treated and many of the women had been mistreated some of the boys slept in the stalls some in the mangers while as many as could crowd into the kitchen did so for there was a welcome fire in the fireplace the march was resumed in the morning a few corpses and dead animals were still in evidence and there was an unbelievable quantity of ammunition and many rifles lying about everything pointed to a hasty retreat the body of italian cavalry passed us during the day and we in turn passed some tommies belonging to an english supply train they shouted after us better get aeroplanes sammy if you want to catch them about this time there was some concern about rations the regiment was able to cross the Monticano river but the pontoons were too light for our heavy trucks and they were forced to make a detour each man had two days iron rations on his person these rations consisted of two small cans of beef and from six to eight hard biscuits our evening meal on this day was half a can of beef biscuit and coffee we reached guarjarin by the evening of november first about thirty miles from treviso as we marched the troops fell out on the sides of the road and pitched tents in the fields during the night as we learned later our trucks with food came up on this road and passed through the sleeping regiment without either party recognizing the other at two a m november second we were ordered on the march the horses were left behind and were to come up later we did not see the reason for starting at this time of the morning until an hour later when we reached a burnt-down bridge at the Livenza River. Here we were forced to wait an hour until the bridge was repaired. We crossed and pushed on in the unknown darkness. At this time we were the advance guard of the 31st Italian Division of the 10th Italian Army, commanded by the British General Earl Cavan. Our own advance guard was a skirmish line consisting of a dozen platoons which 
scour the country ahead of us we breakfasted in maron at nine a m we continued our march during the day we crossed the meduna river and in the afternoon camped near simpelo at the last crossing the machine guns were dismantled and carried across while the mule swam for the last few hours we were on the heels of the rapidly departing enemy he showed himself skillful in retreat at times we were told he had passed just five hours before us and we strove to catch up with him on this day rome reported that the austrians were fleeing from udine fifty miles east of the piave river and that eighty thousand prisoners and sixteen hundred guns had been captured by the allies on the eastern or low land section our front the austrians were in full retreat in the mountains the battle was undecided the position of the americans as mentioned above was that of advance guard of the tenth army we also occupied the center the italians being on our right and the british on our left however at that time we saw or heard nothing from our allies in the morning of november third we again took up the pursuit after marching about twelve miles we reached san lorenzo about two thirty p m and called it a day our kitchens had failed to cross at one of the rivers and had not yet caught up so there were no hot meals besides we had been using our emergency rations and with our supplies somewhere in italy we were in danger of hunger fortunately the austrians had not gathered up all of the corn and we were able to buy a sort of corn meal from the natives called polenti the people had also dug up some wine that had been hidden from enemy eyes for many months after tasting it we were sorry the austrians had not discovered it during the evening of the third three of us succeeded in annexing a corn husk bed and therefore enjoyed a real sleep in the morning we received a bowl of hot half and half and thought it the best breakfast we had ever had the people were very kind to us but it was noticeable that they were actuated greatly by fear the long austrian occupation had left its effects upon them and they could not understand when we offered to pay for our accommodations when we stopped at san lorenzo on the previous day the second and third battalions with attached platoons had pressed forward until they reached the tagliamento river at a point called ponte de la delicia about four miles from san lorenzo the bridge there had been blown up by the enemy and was still burning the austrians held the opposite shore having entrenched themselves behind the high dikes which also afforded strong positions for machine guns notwithstanding this they allowed the americans to advance to the river during the evening an english-speaking austrian called to the americans asking for a parley one of the officers was sent to him the Austrian informed him that at 3 p.m. an armistice between Italy and Austria became effective, and therefore they could see no reason for further bloodshed. This was not news to the American commanders. The officer returned safely to the American lines and reported. However, notwithstanding the folly of further hostile demonstration, the preparations to attack were continued. What if the careers of a few hundred Americans in the bloom of youth were suddenly ended? What if a few hundred mothers and fathers never again looked on the fair features of their sons? Life was cheap in Europe in 1917 and 1918. The regiment could not return to America with no battles to its credit. Glory is always preferable to life as i mentioned before the bridge was in flames which threw a sort of screen about the vicinity so that the austrians evidently did not correctly interpret the american activities at any rate they did not immediately fire the second battalion and machine gun company were to pass over the remaining section of the bridge descend to the dry river bed and deploy along it company h was to be held in reserve battalion headquarters was located behind one of the large concrete abutments of the bridge and from this point the action was directed headquarters company was to entrench along the bank and the third battalion moved to the left in support our patrols reported about a battalion of austrians across the river 
in the darkness of the early morning the americans were drawing up along the river bed and artillery support was arranged for most of the movement had been completed when about three thirty a m the austrians opened fire but fortunately their bullets went high as revealed by their tracers the american movement being completed just as dawn was breaking about five a m the order to advance was given when about twenty yards had been covered the americans were ordered to lie on the ground only a few rounds had been fired and these were as well controlled here as on the firing range the discipline was perfect when cease firing sounded down the line not a straggling nervous shot was heard a little later the order to resume the advance was given and this move took the americans across a shallow stream again they lay low and the allied guns raked the austrian positions which were so badly battered this much having been accomplished the command to advance was again given and this move took the boys over the top they yelled like indians as they rushed forward and they maintained such a line as one sees only at a practice maneuver for a band of untried soldiers they were splendid the austrians returned a hot fire but the boys pressed on as true brothers of the doughboys in france on and on they went and when at last close quarters were reached they showed that they had forgotten nothing they had learned in the bayonet drills back at camp sherman they were irresistible the enemy broke and fled in the same extended order the pursuit was continued in every possible place which might shelter an austrian was searched until the town of Kodroipo was reached, where the order to halt was given. At 3 p.m. on the 4th of November, the armistice became binding, and the conquerors rested on their laurels. Every Austrian inside a designated line was a prisoner. Most were willing ones. One of the prisoners, marching into Kodropio with the Americans, attracted the attention of the villagers, who shook their fists at him and called derisively, you won't shoot your machine gun from our church tower any more. He had told the Americans he was a railroader and knew nothing about war. Regimental headquarters was still at San Lorenzo with the 1st Battalion. At 7 a.m. on the 4th, about two hours after the battle, we left San Lorenzo and marched to Valvasone. Our victorious comrades were out of sight and hearing across the river, and we remained on our side pitching pup tents along the river shore here we learned for the first time that at three p m an armistice with austria went into effect at first it seemed increditable some time later the order was issued to unload all guns at three p m and this announcement confirmed what we had first thought was a rumor and as the boys broke formation mighty cheers rang out and caps were thrown high in the air throughout the day and night shots were heard sounded like war but it was only intensely happy italians throwing superfluous hand grenades now that austria was out of the war we wondered how long germany could stand alone the ever-present rumor told us that we were soon to leave for bavaria to beat upon germany's back door it seemed that we were to see some real fighting at last on the fifth of november there was a continual stream of austrian prisoners coming over the bridge and on the opposite shore there were thousands of prisoners waiting to cross every rank of the austrian army was present generals with their staffs as well as ragged nearly bare feet privates many young italian women ran out to the road as the officers passed and recognizing some of their former prosecutors caught hold of their feet and dragged them from their carriages slapping and otherwise humiliating them to the allied soldier every prisoner was a promising possibility for plunder and the italians were exceptionally adept at this forming two lines the italians forced the austrians to march through in single file while they searched the prisoners pockets after which they were made to run the gauntlet sometimes even water bottles were snatched from them the americans were apt pupils and many were souvenir hunting but i do not think they prized water bottles generally they gave a few cigarettes if they found anything of value upon the prisoners eight thousand of these prisoners came into american hands for delivery to an english prison camp 
they were sent back guarded by several headquarters bicycle orderlies the top sergeant of these orderlies was a mischievous-looking light-haired lad so short as to have received the name of shorty as the column marched along the road several big austrians stopped to argue among themselves about something and paid no attention to the guards who ordered them on however when shorty appeared and used the butt of his rifle across a couple of backs the argument stopped and the march continued arriving at the english camp shorty reported his eight thousand prisoners to the officer in charge who asked with twinkling eyes do you want a receipt receipt blank said shorty i'm glad to get rid of them at five p m november fifth we were ordered back to san lorenzo and on the march i noticed that my buddy was shaky and dizzy he had been complaining of a bad cold and headache but we thought it nothing more serious than grip toward the end of the two-hour walk it was necessary to grasp his arm and help him with his pack once more in san lorenzo we found our cornstalk bed and he retired immediately during the evening he ate a little polenti he seemed very tired if only our kitchens or supplies would reach us we still had our emergency rations but we dared not eat too much of them fortunately we were able to borrow twenty-four hours rations from the british in san lorenzo we learned that the casualties at the bridge had been one killed and seven wounded the dead soldier corporal charles s kell g company had been shot through the forehead the injured were being cared for in an improvised hospital in san lorenzo with the odds against them every wounded man recovered certainly the regiment was a remarkably fortunate one on the following morning we set out for the bridge we had left the night before my friend was feeling better after his good night's sleep and said little that was discouraging we had proceeded but a short distance when upon coming around a curve in the road we sighted the long line of steaming kitchens every face beamed and a greater cheer greeted the eats than that which greeted the news of the armistice at noon we reached the bridge and stopped for mess it was the first hot meal for several days and slum never tasted better the bridge was choked with traffic so that we were forced to wait until nearly three p m to get started while waiting i noticed our two automobiles crossing the dry bed of the river a happy thought struck me and i started for them there was only the driver one officer's and some officer's bedding rolls in the one car and i determined to get in with the baggage when at last the order came to march i was perched on top of the baggage the colonel adjutant and an italian liaison officer acting as guide were in a fiat we followed them besides those mentioned there was a chaplain and a driver riding in a motorcycle with sidecar attached the marching troops were soon left behind and we continued until we reached Codroipo, where our second battalion and attached platoons awaited us from their lips we learned of the hard chase they had given the austrians with almost nothing to eat and no sleep for thirty-six hours they were a tired lot but they were full of praise for daddy butler the red cross man who distributed chocolate bars and cigarettes to them before they went out over the top among their captures was a great supply depot containing about two million dollars worth of military stores while we talked the rest of the regiment came up and halted in the road after some discussion it was agreed that hot supper from the rolling kitchens should be served to the second battalion before proceeding returning to the automobile again we set out after the fiat after riding several miles we reached a little dark village where the occupants of the fiat alighted from their car and passed up the street seeing that we were to stop for a while the chaplain and i walked about the village hoping to find something for the inner man since we had eaten nothing since noon there was an osteria a short distance away where we were served sardines and beautiful fresh bread when the chaplain asked for the bill the signora smilingly answered niente nothing seeing that things were cheap and wishing to take something to the drivers 
the chaplain asked for three more cans of sardines and some bread while these were being brought an english-speaking italian soldier approached and asked us if we would like some steak we looked at each other in frank amazement for we thought the country had been stripped of eatables recovering ourselves we decided to try the steak we laughed heartily over our luck as we consumed the delicious steak and bread and thought it fine to be treated like grand deliverers of these poor abused people while we dined an italian came from another room and asked the chaplain his rank the chaplain answered truthfully since then we have wondered what effect that had on the conclusion of this episode for when we asked for our bill we heard not niente but thirty lires six dollars the chaplain dug deeply into his pocket only chaplains have that much money and we left with a dark brown taste in our mouths so much for deliverers later the fiat passengers returned and we resumed our advance after traveling some time we began to see that our italian guide did not know as much about these roads as he thought he did he stopped frequently and with his flashlight examined his map it was now about midnight and the countryside was asleep notwithstanding this upon arriving at a little village we stopped before several homes blew our horns threw stones at the windows and called out until finally a woman replied not much was learned from her and in disgust the guide took his seat and we began to circle the neighborhood we finally understood that he did not know where he was we wondered how the marching troops were standing the long march and also if they too would be marched in circles when they reached this point i heard later that they did that very thing eventually our guide had a thought and we raced after the speeding fiat through the dark silent night going at top speed to keep up with it and fearful that we would lose the motorcycle which had no light after much breathless racing about we reached a town near pozuola both cars stopped in the town but in a few minutes the fiat went on while we remained we understood that we would go no further that night and as it was cold we followed a streak of light coming from a building the door of which was standing open we found half a dozen men shelling corn over in the corner there was a large pile of corn cobs not long after the men departed kindly failing to put us out as our troops were nowhere in sight and no move seemed imminent we took advantage of the pile of corn cobs with the driver's three blankets we three chaplain sergeant major and driver lay down side by side on the cobs and fell asleep the sound of a running motor awakened us and we sprang from the bed and out to the road the driver was not around but he returned later with the news that the troops were close by we joined them at Pozuola. they had not reached the point until nearly four a m and then when the command to halt was given they were so tired and disgusted that some lay down in the muddy road and slept the rest fell off to the side and pitched pup tents all were exhausted and dear reader the war in italy was over what was the object of this terrible march officially recorded as forty-three kilometers 27 miles but more like 35 miles according to the men who marched it we were rushing to no beleaguered allies our presence at this point was not vital to anyone's safety was it to prove to the imbecile officers italian english or american who ordered it that americans could accomplish it i wonder how many deaths could be traced to the miserable events of this night how many tired undernourished lads found the first flu germs on the damp ground as they lay there exhausted after their struggles at ten o'clock after a warm breakfast the march was continued and at noon we halted at lovario and went into billets resting here until noon the next day we again resumed the march covering the twelve miles to a field near iplis before evening the boys pitched tents and prepared for a short stay headquarters detachment went on to iplis and procured an empty house some of us found a badly battered stone barn for the horses and gathered straw and made a comfortable bed on the second floor for ourselves 
not a window or door was in the place and at night the wind swept up the valley whistling in the door and out of the windows the julian alps were in plain view before us while here we formed an acquaintance with a friendly english-speaking italian who one evening took two of us to a supper of the italian's sergeant's major we could scarcely believe our eyes when soup chicken lettuce cheese bread and wine were brought in at the same time our mess sergeants were making life miserable for the supply company who they claimed were not delivering enough canned beef and hard tack on the eighth we had a rumor that germany was going to capitulate on the tenth the colonel left for padua the headquarters of the american mission to italy we wondered what was in the air while at Eplis the whole regiment was marched to the river where they bathed in the cold mountain water luckily the air was not cold on this day on the eleventh the german armistice was signed and on the twelfth the second battalion packed up hurriedly and was marched off to dalmatia we who remained also took up the march at one p m on the twelfth and proceeded to cormans austria having crossed the border line about three p m end of section six section seven of in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Italy with the 332nd Infantry by Joseph L. Letow. Chapter 6 Cormons, Austria. From Cormons to Treviso. On arriving at Cormons at the close of November 12th, the regiment pitched tents in the field close to town. Regimental headquarters and the detachment found a two-story building, cleaned it as usual, and occupied it. The next morning was spent in ransacking the place which, from the maps, pamphlets, and books, had evidently been the headquarters of the Austrian police. One of the books found was called Strafprozess and was written in question-and-answer form, seemingly for the guidance of the police in examining questionable people. In the yard of the building we found several rifles and much ammunition. The curious thing about the rifles was an inscription on the steel barrel which read, Republicana Mexicana. The boys in the companies had found a storehouse full of guns, knives, and other implements of warfare and had collected quite a few souvenirs, but the officers heard about it and ordered everything replaced. During the day, the companies were marched to a barracks a short distance from town. This barracks is reputed to have been built by the Austrians in 1832. It was a decided improvement over pub tents, since the weather was very cold, damp, and raw. It was difficult for Americans to procure fuel so a barracks was imperative. Cormons has a population of about 6,000 and is a lively place for its size. While many Italians live here, German is spoken in most of the stores. In those owned by Austrians, we were very coolly treated, and one could readily see the glow of resentment beneath the sullen stairs. However, with many Italian troops in the vicinity beside our own, no serious outbreak was feared. Nevertheless, the losers were by no means paralyzed, for one night a train full of Italian refugees was thrown from the tracks with serious consequences, due to malicious tampering with the rails. Again on another night, our tranquil existence was thrilled by the clang of a fire bell. Running to the street, we saw a primitive manpower hose cart being pulled down the street. Following this, we came to the scene of the fire, which was one of the wings of a war hospital. It was the only wooden building in town, and fortunately was unoccupied. The flames were beyond control of the fire department, whose efforts consisted in trying to keep the fire from spreading to the other parts of the building. Of course, this fire was attributed to the Austrians. 
with a german signature to the armistice the war ended for us some dream that for them the famous saying heaven hell or hoboken by christmas would come true it was intolerable to think that we would not be on the way at that time little drilling was done only the necessary chores were performed for the rest we awaited orders and wrote letters at this time the mail came in regularly and the news from home helped to pass the weary hours of waiting my buddy pulled through the long march somehow but a few days after reaching cormans he complained of chills and his body shook even while he sat next to a fire we urged him to see the doctor a few doors away whose chief occupation these days seemed to be feeding wood to the adjutant stove he hesitated I believe he feared that he would be sent to the damp, gloomy hospital at Udine, away from all his friends. His condition showed no improvement, and when his temperature was taken by a medical sergeant, it was so high that the sergeant tagged him flu and sent him to the hospital. It was the last time we saw him alive. This good pal who had been too plucky to drop out on the march, when he must have felt that the march was killing him. There was much influenza in Cormons, within the regiment and among the natives. We were made aware of this latter fact by the almost daily procession of priests, acolytes, mourners, and bearers carrying the corpses which passed our door. In the hospital at Udine, five of our lads had died in four days, and many in the regiment had heavy colds, which caused much concern. The climate was miserably raw and cold. A novel and pleasant way to beat the flu, as practiced by some of the boys, was to keep their bodies warm with frequent doses of cognac. When the regiment was at Vallejo, the subject of grapes was mentioned. During the maneuvers in the trenches with the Arditi, grapes were stolen from vineyards, and the owners of these vineyards turned in bills for something like 24,000 lires, about $4,000, against the Americans. Our claim officer would not agree to pay this amount, and he succeeded in having it lowered about one half. Every man and officer was obliged to contribute. Officers were charged five lires, non-commissioned officers four lires, and privates three lires. Some of us never saw the vineyards. Others had no objection to the tax. This was but one of the many claims presented. The Italian attitude seemed to be that all Americans were millionaires, and that it was their duty to get all they could from the Americans while their getting was good. On November 18th, the 3rd Battalion packed up and entrained for Fiumi to do international police duty. Gone then were the glimmering hopes of an early departure, for the rumor persisted and seemed to have foundation that the 1st Battalion and headquarters were bound for Triste. However, so I heard, the colonel prevailed against the American mission at Padua, that our place was in Treviso, where our supplies lay in warehouses. Accordingly, early Sunday morning, November the 24th, with great joy in our hearts, we were ready for the return to Treviso. The companies were to walk, despite the thousands of Italian trucks standing idle. However, the packs were put upon American trucks so that they were unburdened, to that extent. Headquarters detachment was fortunate in being allowed to ride upon the trucks which carried the office equipment and some officers' bedding rolls. The trip was one to be remembered. When we started, the day was pleasantly brisk but not cold. Leaving at eight o'clock, we traveled without adventure until we reached the Livenza River. Here the bridge had been blown up and a platoon had been built in its place. When we started across, an Italian lieutenant stopped us, saying that the pontoon was not strong enough for our heavy trucks. All argument was of no avail. We were in a strange country, and to make a detour of several miles, as he suggested, would cause us endless trouble. Even while we talked, an Italian truck crossed the pontoon towing a second truck. We pointed to the two trucks crossing at one time but we received only his maddening smile and a refusal. Some of the boys in the party were in favor of emulating one of our sergeants, who during our advance was bringing food to us. 
as the story goes the sergeant's trucks were approaching a pontoon when an italian colonel ran out with arms wildly waving while he voiced a loud refusal the sergeant was a man of few words he knew that the regiment was in need of food and he thought the pontoon was strong enough having faith in his judgment and cause he displayed his automatic and motioning the trucks forward backed the colonel across the whole pontoon the pontoon creaked and trembled under the heavy trucks but fortunately no mishap occurred our errand was not so urgent so we turned about feeling very bitter as this appeared to be just another instance of that antagonism to which we had been subjected by the italians since the day of the armistice after following the river for five or six miles we came to a bridge and crossed it was now nearly dark and we should have been approaching treviso with evening the weather grew colder and as a pleasure party our trip was a failure we reached the piave soon after and successfully crossed the creaking pontoon however we had not gone a hundred yards beyond when as we were climbing a hill both trucks stopped upon investigating we learned that both had run out of gasoline it was a peculiar coincidence on either side of us were damp clay embankments and all about was darkness what should we do we were in a strange country and in a poor part of that so far as replenishing our gasoline supply went we thought we could borrow a can from one of the many passing italian fiats but no one seemed to have an extra can meanwhile someone rooting around among the packs and boxes on our truck found a three-gallon can of gasoline but that would not take us to treviso which we were told was twenty miles away we again resumed our efforts to beg gasoline from the italians but when some time had passed without our efforts being rewarded the boys in loud voices told the countryside what they thought of the italian nation in general and these italian drivers in particular about this time we noticed a can of gasoline in the rear of a truck which had stopped close by however when we edged near to lift the gasoline the driver suspected and moved the can fresh outbursts of american oratory hailed this failure but out of the din rose a voice speaking the american language with a slight accent and the voice asked who wants gasoline before the speaker could have changed his mind a half dozen answered here as he came nearer we saw he had a five gallon can we thanked this italian who had been to america loaded him down with cigarettes and poured the gasoline into our truck with eight gallons we felt we could make treviso bidding farewell to the occupants of the other truck with the promise of speedy relief we set forth without a map we stumbled onward in the darkness we had traveled several miles along a dark road when upon reaching the end we perceived a river but no bridge or pontoon it was a delicate task to turn the large truck in the narrow road retracing our tracks we set out again fearful now that our gasoline would become exhausted to add to the discomfort the snow fell and the night grew very cold however we were on the right road and at ten p m we entered the gate at treviso during this time the companies were walking to treviso on the first day of this tiresome march they covered twenty seven kilometers at seven the next morning the march was continued without a rest for the noon meal and at five p m another thirty five kilometers were passed here the tired footsore lads went into billets until seven a m of the twenty seventh when the march was resumed and thirty eight more kilometers were marched on november twenty eighth thanksgiving day they enjoyed a dinner of slum and reached Osson, a suburb of treviso at four twenty p m the distance march this day was thirty two kilometers end of section seven Section 8 of In Italy with the 332nd Infantry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry by joseph l letow chapter seven treviso after the drive rome once inside the gates we were happy despite our hunger and cold for both were soon forgotten and in addition the boys who had remained in treviso to guard our stores and to forward supplies shared their bunks with us it may be well to say a little more about these lads who had remained at our base when the regiment marched to the front there were about one hundred and fifty of them but as men came from the hospitals and could not join us in austria this casual detachment as it came to be known doubled in numbers and occupied all available space at the time of our unexpected arrival they had a fairly elastic organization accustomed to serving meals at all hours treviso had now taken on a different aspect by day and by night the war being over many citizens had returned the marketplace livened up on market days and the boards came off the house windows the stores opened but at noon according to custom they closed from twelve to two while the shopkeepers retired to their beds at night with no fear of air raids shades were not pulled down and the street lights were lit while italian soldiers singing o solo mio and other favorites made the nights cheery besides americans there were british and italian soldiers in treviso with many soldiers and the great number of citizens returning home it was difficult to obtain a building for regimental headquarters so it was not until the fifth day after returning to treviso that we found a home which provided room for four offices and sleeping quarters for the detachment and the band the line companies of the first battalion were stationed in an italian barracks they had little to do other than the usual fatigue and a small amount of drilling most of the afternoon and evening was free but with the lack of amusement the hours hung heavily later the y m c a helped with a reading room and canteen and the english who had leased a theater entertained us with shows and movies many walked across country in search of souvenirs visiting prison camps and battlefields in the region of the piave and before long barracks bags were filled with shells copper paper knives austrian helmets and even rifles and swords with plenty of time a great fad of decorating shells took hold and some beautifully decorated shells resulted our pleasures and anticipations however were tempered with sorrow for during the latter part of november there was a funeral nearly every day my friend died november twenty seventh and he and another friend were buried november twenty ninth the bodies in boxes draped with the american flag were placed in a truck the band played a funeral march and the sorrowful procession started besides the band and truck there were in the procession the chaplain the firing squad the pallbearers and the friends of the deceased at the italian cemetery we advanced to a corner where there were many new unpainted crosses on the tops of which were nailed the aluminum identification discs worn by every soldier the chaplain read his prayers over the remains the bodies were lowered and thus ended the earthly career of these brave lads who were never to see their loved ones in this life two new wooden crosses were added to the others and later two little numbered stones were placed on the graves the band formed and as it marched up the street struck up a lively march according to custom shortly after we were in receipt of a communication from earl cavan who had commanded our army corps during the drive in his letter he commended the regiment on its conduct and awarded the regiment the english distinguished service order at this time the good feeling which had existed between the italian and american soldiers threatened to end many of us thought that the original cause was cigarettes and tobacco in the first place when the americans received permission to bring cigarettes and tobacco into italy the italian government insisted that none be sold to italians therefore when the doughboys came from the y and the commissary with cigarettes the italians who could buy only twenty of the atrocious 
Macedonian cigarettes a week from their stores, wished to purchase American cigarettes. Now the Americans could not sell them to the Italians without violating the command of the Italian government. However, finding that they could not buy cigarettes, the Italians began to beg them. At first the boys were generous, but eventually an American could not step from his billet without finding several Italians waiting to say, Cigaretta. It grew tiresome, this Cigaretta, and when an American hothead met an Italian hothead, the inevitable resulted. The feeling thus started spread in other directions. The people of Europe, Italians not excepted, seemed to think it legitimate to grossly overcharge when the opportunity arose. In some of the Italian stores there are signs which read fixed prices, but like many signs they meant nothing. The way to buy in Italy is to ask the price of an article, and upon obtaining it, divide it by two, three, or four, and if you really want the article, haggle and walk toward the door several times until the storekeeper comes near your price. This was an unusual method for Americans, and much ill will resulted. When the Americans entered Italy, an agreement was made between the two governments as to amounts and kinds of food the Italian government was to furnish the American soldiers. After we were in Italy, there were times, of course, when certain articles were not available, and therefore could not have been issued to the Americans. However, as the supply company men know, there were other times when the Italians refused to issue foodstuffs on the grounds that they did not have them. The American sergeants refused to believe them, and upon forcing their way into the Italian commissary, found the foodstuffs there. On another occasion, the paying officer and his assistants placed their safe with money for the troops at Fiumi and Cataro, in an Italian railroad car. American guards were placed with a safe. Officious Italians, with no justifiable reason, put guard and money off the car. Rather than create trouble, the American captain was man enough to hold his peace for the time. The matter was taken up with the Italian authorities, and the captain finally succeeded in getting his money to the men. On other occasions, I have been told, it was only the backbone of the American boys in charge of the American mail that prevented sneering Italian officials from cutting open and going through the mail bags containing not only personal mail, but United States government official mail. These matters were generally adjusted, but no guarantee seemed capable of preventing a recurrence. It seemed to many of us from the treatment accorded Americans, that the United States of America was a fourth-rate power, cringing and begging for the goodwill of powerful, majestic Italy. Possibly, and I prefer to think it, the government of Italy was doing all for us that it could. I believe that our troubles arose from officers below the rank of general, who were tainted with Bolshevism and saturated with self-importance. It seemed also that some of the higher American officers cared more for the smile of an Italian official than for their countrymen's welfare. In the early part of December, it was decided to send about 40 convalescent soldiers of the 3rd Battalion, together with the mail and baggage, to Fiumi. Accordingly, arrangements were made for them to leave on a fast train Saturday, December 14th. However, the time of departure was postponed by the Italians to the next morning, and then again put off until the afternoon. At 2 p.m., the six soldiers arrived at the station to enter their box cars, which stood on a siding. Strange to say, when inquiry was made, not an Italian official knew anything about the disposal of these cars. It was finally decided that they would go forward Monday morning. At this time, the boys boarded the box cars, and at noon the train left Treviso. After a few miles, it was held up for two hours, and at Casarsa, the engine put the cars on a siding and departed. It was a cold, damp night, and the box cars were poor shelter for sick men. Tuesday morning came, but there was no sign of an engine, and the station officials could not say when a train for Fiumi would arrive. In the afternoon, the cars were moved along about ten miles, and here again the officials knew nothing. 
hearing that the rome triste express came through porto gruaro the american lieutenant in charge decided to send all but six men on the express the officials made out the necessary passes and when the express arrived the men boarded it however an italian policeman ordered them off and was supported by an italian colonel who said enlisted men were not allowed to ride on the express the lieutenant appealed to the station master who then admitted that the colonel was right the american explained that the men were sick but he received only insults and refusal from the officious colonel the station master promised another train that evening but none arrived and on thursday the lieutenant thoroughly angry wired a higher official and at three p m the cars moved out of porto cruaro again that night the cars were sidetracked but the lieutenant quickly obtained action here and with several more delays finally reached fiume at noon december twenty first instead of a ten or twelve hour ride five days and five nights were required to make the trip this is a sample of the treatment which makes the three hundred and thirty-second anxious for another war in italy after the english had left treviso the american y leased the town theatre for vaudeville band concerts and pictures our band gave several grand concerts here which were greatly enjoyed incidentally the y made itself popular with the boys by charging them to hear their own band play the interior of the theater consisted of an orchestra and several tiers of boxes instead of a gallery and balcony as in our theaters just before thanksgiving nine men dressed in german civilian clothes made of paper came into our midst they were thoroughly questioned and examined and it was established beyond doubt that they were american soldiers wounded and captured in the chateau thierry drive they had been sent across france and germany into poland along with hundreds of other prisoners they did not complain of their treatment at the hands of the germans but said that they had not obtained proper food nor proper medical attention they told of operations undergone without anesthetics at their first opportunity they had made their escape a few weeks later an american captain found his way into treviso and his story brought out the fact that he had been commander of some of the nine men mentioned above he was greatly surprised to find american soldiers in italy the red cross assisted us materially from their great supplies they gave us blankets pajamas socks sweaters and much food we had been unable to obtain potatoes for several weeks but the red cross furnished us with them as the censorship was off the mail many began to send home souvenirs and sometimes the post office had to refuse austrian helmets for the office was full of them about the first of december we received a red white and green service stripe from the italian government which denoted four months service on the italian front this was immediately christened the macaroni bar a few days later december eighth we received the american gold v for six months overseas service christmas which we had so fondly hoped would see us on the way home at last came during the day nothing special occurred except that the christmas boxes from home were distributed and this served to impress the thought of home more firmly upon the mind however there were many private celebrations and at six thirty p m about twenty of us filed into the dining room and prepared to partake of a real christmas dinner the splendid meal consisted of soup fish mashed potatoes turkey dressing gravy sweet corn bread butter pumpkin pie cornstarch pudding with peaches and cream coffee wine champagne and fruit punch the whole was most excellently prepared by a quartet of the best cooks who ever donned a khaki uniform during the evening speeches stories and songs obliterated the mean walls and took us back home to our dear america it was a most successful dinner and christmas night many rumors filled the air these days some said we were going to fiume some said triste while others more imaginative said the balkans all seemed agreed however that home was in the distant future 
with few exceptions the life in treviso was a humdrum existence the rest after the strenuous days before the armistice was very welcome but the long idleness gave the men too much time to think of home naturally they became discontented this frame of mind was capable of producing mischief so in the early part of december passes were given to venice milan and other nearby towns venice just nineteen miles away drew most of the visitors since railways were owned by the government no fare was paid by the military a pass from the commanding officer with the regimental staff being all the authority required the conductors could not read english so the boys unable to obtain authorized passes made their own and these were accepted so long as they bore a signature in december we learned that president wilson would be in rome january third nineteen nineteen so on january first a detachment consisting of the band and an honor guard of twenty-five were sent to greet him after a twenty-four hour ride we reached the eternal city and were shown to an italian barracks and later to the red cross quarters which were more satisfactory with a consuming desire to see the great city we were soon on our way to st peter's and the vatican and their many wonders which however i shall not here attempt to describe in the morning of january third we prepared to welcome the president our band and guard we learned with dismay were not considered by the italians to be necessary in the parade of welcome so this pleasure being denied them the boys planned a welcome of their own and the thin column of yanks attempted to break through the mass of people at via nazionale the spectators a score deep were held off the street by a solid cordon of soldiers who reached from the station to the president's palace the soldiers seeing the americans endeavor to break through the line called for reinforcements but italy has neglected football in a few minutes the thin american column was over the line was reformed and was marching up amid the applause of the romans and the discomfiture of the italian officers at the station the khaki-clad column formed its own cordon of welcome rome was in holiday attire this morning Via Nazionale, the main business street, was ablaze with Italian and American flags, and with standards of the Italian provinces. Rome had not seen such crowds in days. Just before 10 a.m., the cabinet members, senators, deputies, General Diaz, Admiral de Ravel, the American ambassador, and other ambassadors, arrived at the station, followed shortly by the King of Italy, a fanfare of trumpets sounded as the train arrived and the star-spangled banner was played king and president shook hands and the various presentations were made amid continuous and frenzied applause waving flags and handkerchiefs the party passed slowly down via nazionale to the quirinal palace which the italians had given over to the president the next morning the band and guard marched to the residence of the american ambassador thomas n page where president wilson was giving luncheon to the italian king the band was to play during the meal and the honor guard at last was given a chance to honor the president about twelve thirty p m the shouts of the people who lined the streets proclaimed the popularity and approach of the president as his party entered the courtyard the opening strains of the star-spangled banner greeted him and he smiled broadly as he passed within a few minutes the king and queen of italy arrived followed by italian statesmen and high army officers among whom was general diaz the idol of the italians the large dining table to which all repaired was beautifully decorated with huge clusters of red and white flowers at both ends of the hall the american and italian colors were hung side by side emblematic of the manner in which italian and american had stood throughout the great war so gloriously ended after the luncheon when the guests had departed some one remembered that the band and guard had not eaten and we were led to the same dining table used by the elite for the benefit of the rest of the regiment who were not present i give the menu roast pigeon steak cake ice cream champagne etc etc 
we had expected to remain in rome for several days but to our astonishment and disappointment we were ordered the next morning to get ready to take the noon train to treviso we had seen enough of rome however to put firmly in our hearts the desire to return end of section eight section nine of italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry by joseph l letow section nine end of section nine chapter eight before returning to treviso let us peep at the third battalion at fiume and the second battalion at cataro when the former hurriedly entrained at cormons they were taken to fiume arriving there november nineteenth their duty was to aid in the international policing of this difficult territory fiume since the armistice was jealously watched by both italy and the new yugoslav state the real issue was and is that the yugoslavs considered this port indispensable to their future while the italians think they should have fiume as a reward for their share in the war this being understood it will be easier to comprehend what difficulties the americans labored under in a work in which they had no material interest after the third battalion detrained at fiume the boys were forced to wait an hour before an Italian officer presented himself to conduct them to their billets. The reception of the people of the town seemed very diffident, and it appeared to be an Italian town from the number of Italian flags flying. No other flag was seen. In the evening, at a meeting presided over by the Allied commander, an Italian general, the American commanding officer was required to furnish two companies of Americans the next morning, for duty in two adjoining towns, Susak and Terzad. The men were to go armed. No trouble was anticipated, although the towns were held by troops of Yugoslav nationality or persuasion. Early on the following morning, K and M companies marched to an Italian barracks, and the Italian general in command placed the two companies under two Italian majors, so that the American captains outranked had no authority this detestable practice of placing a higher italian officer over the highest ranking american officer present was a favorite play of the italians not content with this procedure a platoon was taken from each of the two american companies and placed under command of italian captains suzek was then entered by two separate columns each led by an italian captain commanding an american platoon italian armored cars preceded the infantry the remainder of the american companies were split up americans being placed in italian companies under the command of italian officers the next move was to place the two american captains with the italian major thereby depriving them of all direct authority fortunately no trouble was encountered it seemed that the yugoslav people believed the american soldiers would be true to the principles enunciated by their president the other town trizat was likewise occupied after which the americans were divided into small groups of from ten to twenty men who with the same number of italians patrolled the two towns the americans immediately became friendly with the yugoslavs this was not pleasing to the italians but the american doughboy bestows his friendship where he pleases these troops occupied this territory for several days then all but about one hundred americans were withdrawn and on december eighteenth these men were called in as the inter-allied military police consisting of english italian and american soldiers were placed in charge fiume is an old city having been known in roman times there is in fact a roman triumphant arch built by claudius the second the modern city of thirty nine thousand population sits in a sort of amphitheatre between the hills and the shore of the gulf of 
Guarnera. A large export business contributes largely to Fiumi's prosperity, as is evident from the wharves, warehouses, and steamships to be seen here. It is said that 7,500 emigrants passed through Fiumi in 1902, which makes Fiumi the cosmopolitan town it is. With such activities at its gate, it is not surprising to see the many imposing public buildings, such as the Governor's Palace, the Austrian Emperor's Palace, and the many large schools and churches. In the northwest part of the city, there are fine public gardens. As intimated above, there are two parts of the town, New Fiumi and Old Fiumi. New Fiumi is a busy, bustling place with wide, clean streets which reminded the boys of American cities. Old Fiumi, however, which is entered through a huge archway, is different. It contains most of the Italian portion of the population, and its dark, odiferous covered alleys have a medieval air about them. Gloomy, vaulted passages lead from one crooked street to another still more crooked, and a walk through these strange byways was delightful in the surprises met at every step. One saw first a bazaar, then a market scene, or an old monument, and again a fountain or a dilapidated old door with a coat of arms. At every turn, as in Italy, there is a little dark, odorous wine room, but the crowd inside is always loud and happy with dances or dice games. The shops in this quarter are open in front. Here is a corn dealer beside an old clothes store, while next door is an image maker. Nearby is a barber shop, with its owner in the doorway sharpening his razor. Across the street is a macaroni shop and an artificial flower store. The fine cafes of Fiumi attracted many Americans, for, aside from their wares, exquisite Hungarian music was offered, and its appealing strains were as enjoyable here as when translated to the American light opera stage. It was no surprise, therefore, that the American soldiers, fresh from the small towns of Italy and the rigorous campaign, should fall in love with Fiumi, especially since the Yugoslavs tried to make life so pleasant for them. The girls were very popular with the soldiers, and before the battalion left Fiumi, there were several weddings. The regimental band was sent for, and on several nights dances were held which were greatly enjoyed. At first the girls could not understand the American way of dancing, but it was not long before they were one-stepping and fox-trotting as if they had never danced otherwise. In fact, to hear the story from the lips of a third battalion soldier, the young ladies of Fiumi threw their hearts at the Americans' feet. The American soldier in Europe was particularly slow to take offense, but once he was aroused, he was as difficult to handle as a disturbed nest of hornets. There were several street fights between Americans and Italians, and the remarkable fact is that no one on either side was killed or even seriously injured. Since we have returned to America, we have read of the scuffles between French and Italians in Fiumi and the resulting casualties becomes evident, therefore, that our colonel was justified in complimenting the men of the 332nd on their gentlemanly conduct. One of the stories concerning these fights is as follows. An American was standing on the street talking with a Yugoslav girl who wore the Yugoslav colors on her waist. An Italian soldier came up and snatched the colors from her and threw them to the ground. The American did what any red-blooded man would do, he knocked the Italian down. At this, several other Italian soldiers came, handcuffed the American, placed him under arrest, and took him to prison. As soon as this became known to the American commanding officer, he demanded the man's release. The soldier was not only released, but the Italian general also insisted on apologizing for the Italian soldier's mistake. On another occasion, so I heard, the American lieutenant colonel, who was in command of the Americans in Fiumi, saw the flags of the Allies flying in the air with the Italian flag uppermost. He therefore informed the Italian commander that no flag was good enough to fly above the stars and stripes, and the Italian must have thought the same, for the Italian flag was soon placed at the same level as the other flags. With company dances, a minstrel show, and the diversions offered by the town itself, time was not heavy, very little drilling was done. 
just before christmas a detail of eight men was sent to triste where they were to assist an american colonel in checking food supplies which the civilian relief was sending into austria for the starving population they were engaged in this work for about two months as in triste so in fiume the friendship between the doughboys and the gobs became very strong throughout their stay at fiume american naval vessels were in or near the harbor of fiume the english soldiers also became quite friendly with the americans as had been the case in treviso an interesting trip to vienna was made by four officers and one hundred men who convoyed a trainload of flour to vienna of course american soldiers were a curiosity in the austrian capital but they were well treated for had they not brought the flour which the austrians so sorely needed while in vienna permission was granted them to visit the emperor's palace a visit which was greatly enjoyed on the return to fiume the train was stopped at an austrian winter resort where some of the americans had their first taste of skiing at last on february twelfth the battalion rolled up its packs said good-bye in several languages to the weeping population of fiume boarded its side door pullmans and set out for genoa they left heavy hearts behind them for the yugoslavs truly loved them and when they had gone i'm sure the yugoslavs realized that truer champions of purer ideals never wore the uniform of soldiers the trip by train took the boys through the battle-scarred fields of northern italy ending on february fifteenth at genoa where the battalion joined the first battalion at the hotel miramare End of section nine. Section ten from In Italy with the three hundred and thirty second Infantry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Italy with the three hundred and thirty second Infantry by joseph l letow chapter nine the second battalion in montenegro and dalmatia the reader will remember that the second battalion suddenly took its pup tents rolled up its packs and hastily departed from the regiment at iplis on november twelfth nineteen eighteen the rumor said they were bound for montenegro the first portion of the journey was by trucks to maestre which was reached at two a m november thirteenth the boys slept in the trucks until morning and at noon billets were assigned them on the fifteenth the platoon of g company departed for fiume it is said that when the italians attempted to enter fiume after the armistice was signed they saw so many yugoslav guns pointed their way that the expedition was called off until americans could be found to land first all felt sure that the slavs would not fire upon americans so the g company platoon led and the italians followed behind this shield the platoon remained in fiume until the third battalion began to come in when they rejoined their company at zelenica on november sixteenth at ten thirty a m the whole battalion having reached maestre trains were boarded which took the troops to venice here after some hours the captured austrian red cross ship argentine received them and at two p m november eighteenth the vessel moved out of the harbor of venice and proceeded down the adriatic to cataro dalmatia the ship docked here at noon on the twenty first and the americans received a great welcome and band concert from the natives montenegrins slavs serbs poles and austrians dalmatia is a narrow strip of land between the adriatic and the denartic alps cataro is situated between the montenegrin mountains and the boche de cataro a beautiful inlet of the adriatic and is the most important harbor on the dalmatian coast its population in 1900 was 3,021. Dalmatia, like Fiume, was a bone of contention between Italy and the Slavs. Besides, after the armistice, a revolution threatened in Montenegro. 
while we were never told why americans were sent to dalmatia the reason must lie in the above facts company f debarked at three p m on the twenty second and was immediately ordered to Cetigne, montenegro by the ever-present italian general companies e g h and detachments of headquarters machine gun supply and medical organizations landed on the twenty fourth companies e and g boarded american sub-chasers and were taken down the bay about fifteen miles to the town of zelenica an austrian submarine base company h and the detachments remained in kataro where battalion headquarters was established company f under its captain began the march over the mountains to the montenegrin capital a few miles away en route a battalion of italians joined the americans when near Cetegne, the march was halted on account of the italians who had been refused admittance to Cetegne a few days before when they had promised to leave that vicinity now according to the theory of the boys at least they were attempting to use the americans as a shield to enter the capital and occupy it when the american captain saw how matters stood he made no attempt to lead his men into the city after remaining a few days outside Cetigne, he decided to return and finally went to teodoro dalmatia where his company was billeted here the company was put to work dismantling austrian warships was a wonderful opportunity for enlarging one's souvenir collection and i understand the opportunity was not overlooked the duties assigned companies e and g at salonica were quite different from f companies when they came into salonica they found the filthiest spot in europe and as usual the characteristic american order to police up was given the barracks had been occupied by russian prisoners several of whom were found in the building dead between the barracks dead horses also were found and all about was filth and debris not content with making the town sanitary those of a mechanical bent made the necessary repairs to the water and electrical lighting plants and soon both conveniences were at their disposal the natives up in the nearby mountains were a playful lot many evenings in the exuberance of their feelings they celebrated by shooting machine guns no one ever accused them of aiming them but it happened that on several evenings a rain of bullets came into the town so the americans were sent up into the mountains to find the happy ones after much hiking the gun was found and the celebrating ceased besides these tests the warehouses were guarded and the peace of the town maintained the chance for recreation here as well at teodoro and cataro was very meagre in this respect dalmatia offered a great contrast to fiume now and then a game of basketball was played at cataro but on the whole time passed slowly until the mail service was established which helped considerably much has been said about the rations received by the boys in dalmatia and the balance of the regiment was inclined to brand the second battalion a lot of discontents however too many men of unquestionable character have said that the rations were far from normal to allow such an impression to remain in the words of an american major who investigated these alleged conditions this ration the standard ration fixed for american troops serving in the italian army as we were has not been issued to the united states troops his statement follows with a list of articles which were not issued he said the meat is of very inferior grade and it is sometimes diseased canned meat is old some issues being put up in the year nineteen thirteen the issues of macaroni and of rice are frequently wormy several men were marked quarters because of the ragged condition of their uniforms and others wore raincoats on sunny days to cover their torn breeches some of the officers gave men their own clothes it has also been said that when the french soldiers came to cataro they would not believe that the ragged soldiers were americans many were marked quarters on account of their shoes and i have heard that one lad had boards tied to the bottom of his shoes to keep his feet off the earth these conditions especially regarding clothing were alleviated before the boys left dalmatia 
the impressions received by the boys were not flattering to the country it was dirty ill-kept and contaminated they said the men were very lazy and the women did all the work that was done the men dressed up and sat in the wine or coffee rooms telling stories throughout the day the women were held as slaves and it was a common sight to see them descending the mountains with loads of wood upon their backs large enough for a mule to carry one day some of the boys were talking to a bridegroom of a month they asked him how he was getting along with his wife oh he replied quickly me get along fine now this wife supports me better than the first one did on another occasion a rainy day a man and a woman were walking along the street the man carried an umbrella over his precious self while his worthy spouse trotted along at his side in the rain carrying a large bundle of wood upon her back like the yanks in every other section the second battalion was busy collecting souvenirs one sunday three machine-gun men were taking apart a one-pound shell which they intended to carry home as a souvenir suddenly the shell exploded scattering deadly fragments two of the boys were badly torn while the wounds of the third were not so severe they were rushed to a serbian hospital where the american doctors performed operations upon them however despite every care one died the next day and another expired on the day following the third was removed to a red cross hospital and eventually recovered this event served to further sadden the already gloomy christmas on january seventh nineteen nineteen company f was again ordered to cantigny to quell a disturbance between the followers of the former king and the adherents of the existing government the trip was full of excitement and some danger although the boys were inclined to view it as a comic opera revolution the americans had a delicate task to perform in attempting to stop a revolution without hurting anyone's feelings while they marched over the mountain road shots were heard up in the craggy mountain sides the captain was leading his company in a captured austrian automobile and in advancing the car got between the fire of the two rival groups later a flag of truce was waved which was immediately greeted with shots but finally the truce was effected at a meeting attended by the rival leaders the revolutionists gladly accepted an offer of safe conduct to their homes they were also given employment at Kataro and loading food supplies from american ships thus the comic opera revolution came to an end and the stalwart natives dressed in their peculiar black hats with a red top huge blue trousers stopping at the knees and high boots gaily waved american flags and cheered the doughboys many of them had been to america so that they spoke some english the americans in fact were held in such esteem that the natives sent a deputation to the american commanding officer with a request that he rule over montenegro until a new government was set up company f returned to its station after its romantic adventure where it cooperated with the french and serbian troops in policing that territory some time before the boys left montenegro a small detachment of americans were sent to brindisi italy crossed the adriatic from Kataro, and through the assistance of these men supplies came regularly to the battalion no more exciting events took place and the boys settled down to the dull wait for the glad day when the order would come that would release them from dalmatia at last early in march the good word came and on the fifth the battalion said good-bye to the beautiful but gloomy dalmatian coast and after four days on the sea joined the first and third battalions at genoa end of section ten section eleven of in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry by joseph l letau treviso to genoa upon returning from rome we found treviso to be the same old muddy rainy town 
from the splendors of rome to old treviso was a far cry but after all treviso was home to us everything so far as going home and the daily routine were concerned was the same as before our departure the red cross nurses at padua made a few evenings happy for doughboys by having dances and luncheons there and the nurses of base hospital number one o two at vicenza helped to keep the officers from losing their grace and conversational faculties in the middle of january we understood that our divisional commander was coming to inspect us and this appeared to be an omen of an early departure however we waited in vain besides these few entertainments and occasional trips to nearby cities the boys had nothing to do but eat chestnuts and sample unknown vinos the band helped with an occasional concert and the y with movies now and then field hospital number three hundred and thirty one which had come with us from france was situated a few miles from treviso in a large hospital building the health of the boys was again very good and the task of caring for the sick was not great the most serious cases were sent to base hospital number one o two located in historic vicenza despite the fact that the nurses at this hospital were forced to take walks to keep warm because of the lack of fuel this hospital in charge of the army nurse corps was very popular with the three hundred and thirty second on the tenth of february the adjutant entered our office looked me straight in the eye and exclaimed you're leaving for genoa tomorrow genoa a seaport we in the office looked at each other with shining faces for genoa spelled h-o-m-e to us after further conversation with the adjutant i learned that six of us were going as an advance party to assist in billeting our troops when they arrived in genoa we started immediately and reached milan the next morning after a cold sleepless night in the little compartment and learned at the english transportation office that a train left for genoa at twelve forty five p m that gave us about five hours to get a wash a warm meal and left enough time to visit the venerable cathedral and the lovely galleria vittoria our route lay along the mediterranean coast the beauties of craggy mountain and blue sea were before us except only now and then when they were interrupted by the eternal tunnels without which it seems one cannot travel ten miles in italy we felt that we were going to enjoy our stay at genoa which was reached about six p m wondering where we were going to spend the night we were overjoyed to see two sergeants of the third battalion advance party who had come to meet us the stately hotel miramare came into view as we turned the corner from the station high up on the hillside this massive stone structure stood a fine-looking hotel and a work of art the desire to see its interior helped us climb the steep hill and when we stood within its marble reception hall and saw its magnificence we were fearful that a mistake had been made we could not believe that doughboys were to have this palace for their billet the rooms were stripped of beds carpets and furniture but there were hundreds of mattresses and sheets sheets for the three hundred and thirty second it was astounding upstairs we found suites of rooms with baths attached it was too much we took our blankets from our packs and fell into the beds provided by our thoughtful friends we spent the next day in obtaining the capacity of the hotel that meant how many of the single mattresses being carried in by the italian soldiers could be put down side by side in a room on the second day in genoa february thirteenth as i sat upon the balcony of the hotel writing a letter i had to remove my blouse because of the hot sun looking up from the letter i saw the blue mediterranean stretching away in the distance and nearer as one looks from the sea to the land behind genoa rises on the hillsides like an amphitheatre with the harbour as the stage the buildings of the city are of stone and the castles and other fort-like structures silhouetted against the clear blue italian sky make an unforgettable picture these structures are several hundred feet above my position while the street is at least 
a hundred and fifty feet below in the hotel garden are spreading palms and other tropical trees a few days later all of the first and third battalions had arrived via train and we were at home in our new quarters the elite miramare which it was said had once entertained the emperor of germany now presented a strange appearance doughboys slept in every corner in which a mattress could be placed in the rooms and the hallways but even those who slept in the hallways were happy for was this not their last italian billet the companies each day took hikes across the city to the charming Lido, where a small amount of drilling was done in the offices especially the personnel the work was very heavy and everyone was anxious to be ready when the word came to board the ship however all had time to explore genoa the superb during these sunny days which were such a delightful change from foggy rainy treviso we found opera houses good restaurants and cabarets here it was the opera season and many enjoyed old favorites such as lucia de l'amour and il trovatore as well as lesser known ones such as the masked ball and the lorelei the singers were very good naturally it was much easier to live in genoa since it was a fair-sized city with the diversions of the modern city along with the good however there was all the immorality of a large city to which genoa was no exception besides on the second of february a party of fifty men were given passes to rome on february twenty eighth the regiment was presented with a beautiful large flag of st george by the genoese the colonel received a gold medal several officers received silver ones and about a hundred men received bronze ones on march first a few of the much looked for insignias or shoulder patches arrived since the regiment was on detached service in italy we were permitted to select our own insignia and the lion of st mark was chosen because our time had been spent chiefly in the old venetian territory a gold lion of st mark with its paws holding the book on which was inscribed in gold three hundred and thirty two all on a red background made up this brilliant insignia destined to be the most admired in the entire a e f a walk about genoa reveals many beautiful palaces and churches the galleries of these palaces contain some of the finest paintings in the world such artists as titian van dyck murillo guido reni rubens and tintoretto being represented in the palazzo bianco are memorials of columbus along which are photos of his letters here is also the violin of the famous paganini of the churches the byzantine black and white san lorenzo founded in the tenth century is most noteworthy one of the side altars is very pretty and among its treasures is a small marble casket said to contain the remains of st john the baptist women are allowed in this chapel only one day of the year in the choir are notable seats of inlaid wood one of which the guide said had been paganini's genoa having been the birthplace of columbus a marble statue of the great discoverer was erected in eighteen sixty two in the piazza Acquaverde. the remains of the house in which he was born about fourteen fifty one is still visible and is but five minutes walk from the centre of the city during the last few days the mail from home had brought newspaper clippings describing the alleged terrible conditions under which the three hundred and thirty second was living especially at cataro a congressman having in his possession letters from members of the regiment describing these conditions had charged on the floor of the house of representatives that the boys were forced to steal food and were without decent clothes etc close on the heels of the arrival of these papers a colonel from general headquarters france had reported to our regiment for the purpose of investigating these charges this he proceeded to do by examining several hundred men individually on the day that i was enjoying the art of genoa the non-commissioned officers were called together and addressed by the headquarters colonel concerning the reports reaching america he deplored the scandal and when he finished the boys were thinking the same as he was 
unfortunately upon completing his talk he left the room it is too bad that he did not remain to hear the regimental colonel whose language would have edified him when that officer finished the boys were in a worse mood than when they entered jenna was mild during march and ball games and boxing matches were in order saturday afternoons at the leto on the evening of the second our band and about three hundred men attended a celebration held at the opera house for the purpose of welcoming home to genoa several battalions of genoese who had fought bravely in france a few days later several hundred american military police came into italy from france until this time we had no m p s other than our own and no one but a soldier can appreciate their absence their coming however relieved our men at rome who joined us on the sixth every american eye carefully scanned the harbor when daylight came each day for we knew our ship would one day steam into the harbor one day the giuseppe verde entered port in treviso we had heard of the ship as being the one that would take us home however on the sixth of march the verde steamed away and the boys settled back to their usual routine with heavy hearts on the seventh of march after several weeks of negotiating we were notified that fifty of the regiment could go to the menton leave area for a week end of section eleven section twelve of in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry by joseph l Letau. chapter eleven genoa reunited after a most enjoyable week at wonderful monte carlo and a safe return to genoa we were enthusiastically greeted at the miramare with the news that we were leaving for home in three days on the steamer duca d'aosta which lay in the harbor the second battalion had come in while we had been away so that the regiment was again united the second was being investigated and we sincerely hoped that nothing would develop that would detain us we welcomed the investigation but preferred it on the other side of the atlantic however our joy suddenly died for on the eighteenth we received a telegram from general headquarters france that our departure was indefinitely postponed all efforts to obtain a release were fruitless and on the morning of the nineteenth general mcandrews pershing's chief of staff and general o'connor chief of staff of the service of supplies arrived their coming meant something serious we were sure some felt that g h q regarded the three thirty second as culprits and that we were to be sent to the labor battalions in france then there was the ever-present trouble in fiume and neighboring territory and we feared that our regiment had been selected to return to that troubled plan the suspense while terrible was short for at two thirty p m all officers commissioned and non-commissioned were called out upon the hotel balcony general mcandrews i believe complimented the non-coms on the appearance of our quarters and we began to breathe easier then he said that our scheduled sailing had been a mistake officers who had been sent to italy to prepare the regiment for its sailing thought the steamships in genoa were for the three thirty second regiment therefore arrangements were made and every one was preparing for the homeward voyage he was sorry the mistake had been made but we could not depart even on order from general pershing for our fate lay in the hands of the supreme war council he said we would have to await our turn settling down once more to an indefinite stay with the best frame of mind possible the boys eagerly took advantage of the company dances arranged by the american girls in genoa some dances were held in the ducal palace once the residence of the doges of genoa the music was furnished by an excellent orchestra recruited from the band members 
since our departure was thus indefinitely postponed passes were issued to men of italian birth and to those of greek birth permission was given to visit greece negotiations were soon under way to send a party of fifty to rome and the same number to menton on the twenty fifth of march fifty men left for each place suddenly on march twenty sixth we received word that we were released and would sail on march twenty eighth and twenty ninth the second battalion k and m companies and detachments of the medical supply and machine gun companies and base hospital one o two were to leave first on the canopic regimental headquarters the first battalion i company field hospital three thirty one and detachments of the medical machine gun and supply companies were to go on the duca d'aosta march twenty ninth l company with detachments were to remain a few days to conclude all business and to pick up any men returning from leaves at this time we had men scattered all over europe and telegrams were dispatched to them all except those who went to greece succeeded in returning in time to go on one of the three ships the canopic left genoa on the twenty eighth of march amid cheers but the departure of the duca was made the principal event because the ship was to carry the colonel those companies which were to go on the duca d'aosta marched through the gaily bedecked streets of genoa amid great applause finally arriving at the crowded dock they filed aboard and as each man walked up the gangplank his arms were filled with boxes containing cigarettes candy and cookies given by the red cross y m c a and knights of columbus the docks were crowded with genoese who faithful to the end had come to say good-bye to their american friends as the ship began to move all the whistles in the harbor shrieked people waved their hands and kerchiefs and they called after the ship their eyes dim with tears genoa will always be remembered by the three thirty second with love and admiration the genoese more than any italian people strove to show their friendship the opera and the presentation of medals and flag and the general manner of treatment were all signs of an appreciative community end of section twelve section thirteen of in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Italy with the 332nd Infantry by Joseph L. Letow. Chapter 12. From Genoa to Ohio. The journey from Genoa to Gibraltar consumed about 40 hours. Since we reached the rock, about 10 a.m. March 31st. The library aboard ship afforded the means of recreation to many, while to others it proved interesting to watch the porpoises race and play at the prow of the ship as we sped through the water. Then there were others who refused to be amused. The ship's crew evidently had been spoiled by carrying American soldiers before for various bribes were necessary before the proper amount of food could be obtained in at least the second-class dining-room with the exception of a few sick men i never heard any of the third-class passengers complaining of too much to eat or of too great a variety arriving in the spacious harbour of gibraltar we did not dock but cast anchor until such time as the ship could be cold a few rods to our left was the famous rock of gibraltar there were at least a hundred other vessels at anchor in the splendid harbor one of these was the canopic which had left genoa the day before us she had stopped at marseilles but had reached gibraltar before us and the next day when we moved into the coal dock we found the canopic alongside us on the morning of the third half of those aboard the two vessels were sent ashore to walk through gibraltar we were glad of a chance to get on land and glad of an opportunity to see the city but we were compelled to remain in ranks every moment we were off the ship at any rate we enjoyed the much-needed exercise and 
also obtained a glimpse of a unique cosmopolitan city of gibraltar it seemed from the slight acquaintance to be a very up-to-date city all of the houses are built of stone and one obtains the impression of cleanliness our shore leave was limited to a walk through the main street and the return when the other half of the men made the trip on the day that we were ashore the vessel was being coaled by hand on the morning of april fourth at seven thirty we moved out of the harbor on our left we could see the rocky shores of africa nothing could be distinguished except the mountains over which hung a particularly dark purple haze on our right lay the green hills of spain and the dark clouds cast a shadow over the hills but where there was a break between two clouds the sun shone through and the little white roofs of the stone houses sparkled as if a spotlight played upon them we soon passed the last point of land and were again upon the broad atlantic the consequent rocking of the ship which we now saw was a very different boat from the stately aquitania disturbed the feelings of many the weather also was colder than we had been experiencing on april ninth we encountered what we thought was quite a storm the waves rushed over the deck rails and those adventurous spirits who loved to stand in the bow of the ship and allow the water to spray upon them were ordered inside the vessel rolled and pitched and standing in the bow of the boat and looking back it was curious to watch the vessel twist about almost like a stretched letter s since passing the azores on the seventh each morning the seemingly everlasting expanse of water met our eyes we grew very tired of the voyage and heartily wished for land to appear we seemed to be making little progress our speed being about fifteen or sixteen miles an hour on the twelfth the sea again became very rough and during the night a heavy fog descended upon us making necessary the weird cry of the foghorn upon awakening the next morning we were relieved to see that the fog had lifted all this day we watched eagerly for land and at last at four forty five p m the shore of long island was visible as we drew nearer our destination we were in time to witness a sunset behind the jersey hills more beautiful to us than all of italy's boasted sunsets later as we passed up the lane marked by buoys the lights of the statue of liberty lighted and a mighty cheer rose on the air we cast anchor inside the harbor and slept in the shadow of america once again it was a most happy night in the morning april fourteenth nineteen nineteen the quarantine vessel visited us found everything okay and in a few hours we were back at camp merritt which we had left some ten months before here we performed a disagreeable duty namely going through the delousing process upon entering the delousing building we placed all of our clothes in wire baskets which were then collected and put into a machine this steam and heat producing machine was guaranteed to effectually put out of existence all cooties etc which had perchance survived the journey across the atlantic while our clothes were thus being cleansed we ourselves bathed so that when we were finished with this bath our clothes dried and also hopelessly wrinkled awaited us being now clean and acceptable we were permitted to move to a respectable section of the camp and proceed to the business of getting out of the army as rapidly as possible there were canteens pack carriers clothes and so forth to be checked and turned in and work on these matters was started immediately the rifles were to be kept for parades the offices were like madhouses because of the hurry the canopic arrived on the night of the fourteenth and the dante alighieri with the last of the regiment came in on the eighteenth on this last ship there were four young women from fiumi who had married americans passes were given freely and practically every one in the regiment enjoyed a visit to new york city on the twenty first the three hundred and thirty second infantry formed at washington square new york and marched up fifth avenue passing thousands of cheering friends and admirers at the head of the regiment besides its commanding officer and his staff rode general guglielmote 
royal military attache to the italian embassy at washington and his staff included in the parade were old garibaldi veterans and representatives of new york's italian societies upon arriving at a hundred and second street the parade passed into central park where mayor highland welcomed the men to new york and america following this the royal council general of italy in new york signor tritoni presented a gold medal to the regiment general guglielmotte then rehearsed the history of the deeds of the regiment in italy and the regiment's commanding officer replied for the regiment after these ceremonies the regiment proceeded to the sixty ninth regiment armory where refreshments were served a few days later the news reached us at camp that the pennsylvania men in the regiment were to be sent to camp dix to receive their discharges there so that on april twenty second we bid farewell to approximately one hundred and fifty men from newcastle pennsylvania most of whom had been in headquarters company several officers and the regular army enlisted men parted with us here on the twenty fourth the regiment marched to dumont boarded the trains and were soon en route to dear old ohio however instead of going direct to camp sherman we stopped at cleveland for a parade the first section reached cleveland in the morning of the twenty fifth followed by the other sections all of which arrived during the day practically all of the nearby towns such as youngstown akron and canton had procured special trains for the relatives and friends of the regiment so that during the day those loved ones who had been separated for a year met and embraced one another once more it was a happy day for many on the twenty sixth the regiment paraded and again as in new york upheld its reputation as being one of the best marching organizations of the a e f after the parade the sons of italy once more endeavored to show their appreciation by presenting the regiment with a silver cup at central armory the entire regiment was banqueted and the boys declared it was the most delicious meal they had since they left home during the remainder of the day everyone was free to visit until about seven p m when the first section moved out of cleveland toward that haven camp sherman where the coveted honorable discharge was to be received april twenty seventh at four a m was a cold and disagreeable day as we alighted from our tourist cars at the camp and were led to our last army home for several days we were busy turning in equipment and preparing final records at the termination of these various duties the red discharge chevrons the finest of them all we thought were distributed beginning on may second the first companies of the regiment received their discharge papers on the third several more went through this process and by the evening of the fifth the entire regiment had been discharged and its members had arrived at the enviable rank of mister no time was lost in boarding the special train for columbus home loved ones and civilian life today a few months later the old days and adventures seem like dreams and while few would care to go through the same hardships and experiences again not one of the regiment i dare say regrets the days he wore the unconquerable khaki of uncle sam in the proud line of saint mark finney end of section thirteen end of in italy with the three hundred and thirty second infantry by j l letow